Hello and welcome to Lost Love Chronicles. I practically fell to the ground beside the car, and I could feel myself going numb. My wounds were leaking blood everywhere, and I was pretty sure I had some type of muscle damage on my shoulder. I could feel a dozen scrapes on my arms and shrapnel in my back. I would find out later that this numb feeling was common for the first few minutes after being shot. The body takes time to process things, and nerve endings need to figure out how much trauma is happening and the deeper the wound, the more time the body sometimes needs. I was starting to lose focus. I could feel the shock beginning to set in and knew I had only a few moments before I lost consciousness, but I managed to move to her and lock eyes. She was bleeding almost as severely as I was. There were people approaching and voices yelling out, but as I drifted off, all I could see were her eyes. After everything, they were all that mattered. Then it was dark and I was back in time. Families are strange organisms. Not one family is alike. The mix of personalities, ages, perspectives, and genetics make each family unique. Mine was no different. My name is Harry Other, and I was the middle child in what you might describe as a classic nuclear family. Martha my mom, Roger my dad, and three kids. My older brother Greg is a burly well-built guy like our father. My younger sister Joan built petite like my mom. I am the odd one out. Unlike the rest of my family, I have sandy brown hair and have a very slim build. When Greg would bully me, dad just laughed and said I needed to toughen up. Life is never fair. He always used to tell me. As we got older, we did all the things that families do. We did picnics, outings to the park. I, of course, got all of Greg's hand-me-downs, even the clothes that were two sizes too big. So my mom just bought me belts and suspenders to hold my clothing together though I was always the one out. Greg and Joan always got new stuff, and I just had to put up with it. I suppose that another thing was that dad was always harsher on me than the others. Greg was like him, and Joan was always his little girl. Dad described me as the mistake. As I entered into my teenage years, my family never worried if I got left out, and they never worried if I got left at home. My mom would sometimes show concern, but then dad would throw his life is never fair comment out, and I would be left alone. The one good thing that came out of being left alone so much is that I learned a lot. I studied, I built something, I got into science and technology at school, and managed to save enough over a few years of pocket money and odd jobs to buy myself a computer. It was computer parts from a few locations, but I built it and learned how things worked. My refuges from my struggles at home were my studies. I learned physics, geography, biology, chemistry, and history. I also learned English, German, and Spanish. I was as a human sponge with all the hours spent alone in my room. I was a straight-A student with high distinctions and honors from my teachers in all my reports in school. Though it felt like my parents didn't care at home, I would get a well done and a small smile from my mother and a grunt from my father. Greg just made fun of me being a nerd. In school, he had only just passed his remedial math classes. In the later years of high school, Greg increased the strength and frequency. He used to beat me under the guise of brotherly love, and Dad appeared to encourage it. Joan sniggered but ignored me. Mom caught me trying to ice a bruise over my right kidney one time and held the ice there for me a couple of minutes while telling me not to encourage my brother. But mom, I don't do or say anything. I try to stay out of his way, but if he can, he always throws punches as hard as he can whenever I am passing by. I whined, the way dad encourages it, and the way Greg treats me, it's like I was born into the wrong family. Mom looked like she wanted to say something but thought better of it. Instead she said, I'll talk to your father and brother about it and get them to lay you off. Not being built like them, I guess they don't think about it. I guess a couple of days later, Mum must have talked to them because Greg started coming into my room every few days when I was asleep, punching me in the stomach. Dad never said anything. But if a man could pull off a combined sneer and a smile, he was it. I was constantly bruised under clothes that never really fit me. I was careful to ensure that no one at school ever saw the results of the beatings until one day. I was being made to run track for physical education class and tripped when someone in a prank threw a metal bar in my way, causing me to fall and open a gash down my arm. I was sent to the medical bay, and the school nurse and older lady called Mrs. Erskine asked me to remove my shirt so she could clean and bind the gash. Harry, sweetie, it's okay. This old lady has raised three sons, and you haven't got anything I haven't seen. We need to clean this to make sure it doesn't get infected. Hesitating a few more moments, I took off my shirt trying to make sure that Mrs. Erskine didn't see the latest set of bruises that Greg gave me two days ago. After a few minutes, I relaxed, and while the wound stung quite severely, she cleaned me up and put a nice and tight compression bandage on the wound. When she finished, I turned and put my shirt on when Mrs. Erskine saw the massive black and yellow mark running up my back. Harry, she gasped, are you okay? I tried to play it down, as I had learnt that in my family, no one likes a snitch, 
I'm fine, Mrs. E. I must have fallen over a few days ago and not understood that I hurt myself. She didn't buy it for a second, but she said nothing and sent me on my way. I didn't know at the time, but she put the word out among all the teachers that she believed someone was beating me up and to keep an eye out. One unintended consequence of my being watched by all the teachers at school was that during my senior year, my teachers banded together to help me, although I never knew it. They had figured out that I was not being picked on at school, and as I had no social life outside of school, they thought it was a home thing. The problem was that they couldn't do anything without causing all sorts of drama or talking directly to me about it. It turns out they did the next best thing. As we neared the end of the year, they helped me submit to several universities and ensured that it was a submission for a school a few hours away to get me out of my parents' house. They worked with me to help me choose a specialization, and I found that I wanted to do a chemistry major, so my science teachers helped me submit a scholarship. Taking a risk, my science and chemistry teacher Mr. Daniels, who I always got along with, reached out to my parents and arranged a meeting about the scholarship submission. They came to the school a week before the submission date, and five of us sat in the room, Mr. Daniels, the school principal, Mr. McDonnell, my parents, and me. Mr. and Mrs. Other, I don't think you understand the opportunity for Harry here. He is one of the brightest students that we have seen in the last few years, and he very well could have a full scholarship to study at university. Mr. Daniels had been going round in a circle with my parents for almost 20 minutes now. That's nice, but as I said before, I am not paying for the boy to go study. He needs a job and to learn his place in the world, he scowled. Mr. Other, Mr. McDonnell invited. What Mr. Daniels is trying to say is that the scholarship that Harry is being offered is fully funded, so you don't have to pay for it. Dad had no response to that, but it didn't take long before he had another reason. Well, all these places are out of town, so he'll have nowhere to live, and again I won't pay for that. We have already thought of that, Mr. Other, Mr. Daniels noted. I have a cousin who owns a business within walking distance of the university. He's been looking for a junior to help out, clean things, and keep everything in his warehouse tidy. It's not glamorous work, he chucked. Indeed, it can be downright dirty and hard work, but it will pay just enough for Harry to have room and board near the university and pay for a few basics like food and his books. I looked at Mr. Daniels funny because earlier, when he told me about the job with his cousin, he told me something entirely different. I would be helping him research and work in a lab very close to the chemistry I would be studying. He looked at me, winked, and gave a subtle shake of his head. I took the hint and said nothing. My dad thought about it for a moment. Well, as long as I don't have to pay and he learns about hard work and it gets the boy out of my house. Excellent, said Mr. McDonnell, getting into it before dad could change his mind. I have the paperwork here already for signature. It took another hour, but in the end, everything was signed and we went home. I was surprised when Mr. Daniels pulled me out of class two weeks later and handed me a heavy set of envelopes. You're good to go. The admissions board has approved your scholarship and my cousin Norman looks forward to meeting you over the holidays before university starts and getting you up to speed. Mr. Daniels, I don't know what to say. Just remember me when you rise to the top. He paused, Harry, you're going to do well in whatever you put your mind to. You're smart, hardworking, and you put others before yourself. All the teachers here at school have had a good idea what's happening at home for a while. I went to retort, to defend my family when he held up a hand. It's okay, you don't have to say anything or defend anyone. We just know and figured out this would be one of the ways we could help one of our bright stars from falling to the earth and crashing. School finished up at the end of the year, as schools here in Australia run on the calendar year, and I found that I finished up third in the school rankings overall. I would have been a tie for first if my parents had let me go on two extra credit off school excursions, but I was again denied. Once we were out of school, Mr. Daniels arranged to come and pick me up to introduce me to my new job. Once we were on our way, he told me to call him Jack, as he was no longer my teacher drove over to the next city, which took just over an hour, and he introduced me up to Norman and helped find an apartment for me. It was a fantastic three-day trip, and I got to talk to Jack and Norman like friends. They listened to what I had to say and explained what I would be doing, Norman had put a word in, and I had the choice of two one-bedroom flats between the school and what would become my workplace. I chose the one closer to work, and it was on floor one of an older but well-maintained apartment block. The building super was a nice older man and told me to call him if I needed any help. On the trip back, Jack and I spoke about what I would be learning, and I think I was excited to see that there may be more to life than being ignored or treated poorly by my family. The evening before I left, my mother came in with a dozen boxes and began to help me pack everything. Mom, I can't take all of this on the bus. It's okay, dear. I have spoken to your father, and I am going to take you up in these boxes in his truck tomorrow. One trip and you're moved. 
Mom almost cried looking at me but came over and gave me the biggest hug that I have ever gotten from her. Once she had her arms around, though, she broke down and sobbed. Oh Harry, my precious and beautiful Harry, you deserve more, I could not do much for you, but I do have a gift. Mom went out of my room and returned with a small box. It was a beautiful A4 notebook and what looked to be an expensive fountain pen. I would use the notebook to record ideas and discoveries in the years to come, and the pen was always on my desk. Don't tell your father, but I wanted you to have something that was just for you too. She trailed off and looked at me, her composure threatening to break. To, to know how much I love you. Then, finally, she walked out, and I could hear her blowing her nose. At dinner that evening, there wasn't a lot said. Joan, don't be more of a looser than you already are. She just looked at me with contempt and looked back at her phone. Dad, I'll make sure to find another big brother there to help look after you, he sneered. But I felt it was an empty thread as I didn't think he knew anyone outside of town. And make sure you don't embarrass this family any more than you already have. Mom said nothing but looked at me with the more sorrowful eyes I have ever seen. The other gift I got that night came a little before midnight, with Greg coming into my room and trying to beat me senseless. As usual, I couldn't resist, and he laughed at me as he walked out, so that you remember your place mistake. I can't say I was unhappy to be leaving. The following year was terrific. I started learning about new chemistry concepts, or combined concepts, and how to make my own discoveries at university. When I wasn't at university, I was at work with Norman putting the theory I was learning into practice. I got to study to my heart's desire, and I was making my own money for once. Being away from my family for the first time, I had never felt freedom, but if this was it, I liked it. Jack also drove up often to hang out and talk with Norman or me, and I thought he appeared to enjoy spending time with me. In my mind, he became the big brother that I always wished Greg had been. I saved pretty much everything on the money front since I never went out, and when I had enough money, he helped me pick out a car. We talked girls, a concept I was too shy to look at yet, and just generally hung out. The only black cloud was that once I had my car, I was expected to head back to my parents for lunch one Sunday a month once I had a car. These were mandatory family gatherings, and Dad demanded that I be there. Since I had moved out, Sunday lunch had grown. Without me underfoot all the time, my parents and siblings now had an ever-changing group of people around most Sundays. It was almost humorous. My family acted as a burden that had been lifted with me no longer there. I got looks from everyone when I was there, wondering why even though my presence was all but demanded. So I just sat on the couch in the corner and politely waited for the afternoon to end so I could head back to my life. Many people who worked for my father were usually there. I wasn't a fan of going alone and being in the same room as them, but as the dutiful son, I obeyed. It was during this early time away, learning and studying, that I made a breakthrough. I made a chemical discovery that increased the strength and longevity of certain plastic compounds. However, when a specific inert common compound was added, the plastic would break down into its inert base components in a matter of a few days. When I presented my findings with Norman at work, he just about passed out. You're a wizard, Harry. This will change our use of plastics globally and make everything a lot more environmentally friendly. Over the next week, we used the lab and repeatedly proved that my formula worked. At the end of the week, we were sitting in his office when Jack walked in, having come up from school, and we got him caught up. Harry, I think there are a few things here that Norman and I need to talk with you about. However, if we do them right, then your discovery and formula will make you famous. Over the next few weeks, Jack and Norman helped me through the process of submitting a patent to ensure that the discovery was mine. Right before school ended, I had turned 18, so thankfully, I didn't need my parents involved. Jack also helped me do a deal with Norman that would set up a new business together to produce the plastic compound. For his trouble, Jack got a single percentage point in the business. Over the next six months, I went from a low-budget university student to bringing in what high-end management consultants do each year. I still didn't have a social life, it was still just university, work and the occasional trip to my parents, but I did do a few things for myself. First, I took out a loan to buy as opposed to rent an apartment, and as usual, Jack helped me find the place, and we went through the motions of buying the place. It was a little further than walking distance, so I would need a decent car as opposed to the 1982 green Mazda 323 that was always on its last legs. We looked around the yards, and that's when I saw her and fell in love. She was a 2010 LS7 V8 Camaro, secondhand and in good condition, low kilometers, and upgraded suspension. I had to pay a little extra on insurance as I was under 25, but it was worth it. When I got in and started her up, she purred for me and was always keen for a drive. Most Saturday afternoons, 
You could find me down in the car park washing and waxing her, ready for the next time I want to drive. Along with my Camaro, I also want to spruce up my personal image a little. I bought some clothes that fit me. With my thin frame, thanks to my high metabolism, I started to think of myself as more than just a nerdy punching bag for my older brother. The next time I headed over to my parents for lunch, I had the best drive, opening my Camaro up on the highway and getting a few looks as I pulled into my parents' drive. A V8 is not precisely a subtle pulling up, so a couple of people came out to see the noise, including my sister Joan. Hey, buddy, this is a private family gathering invite. She trailed off as she looked at me for what felt like the first time. Hey, sis, it's just your dorky older brother coming back for lunch. She didn't know what to say. However, a couple of her girlfriends came over to ask about the car and who I was. They couldn't believe that I was Joan's older brother or that I had such a car. It was interesting to be the center of attention and be positive for once. I couldn't help but smile. Inside, my mother looked at me and almost cried seeing my new clothes and smile, but she hugged me. Dad and Greg just glared at me like they always did. Dad looked upset and Greg looked angry. After that, my father, brother and sister pretty much avoided talking to me other than a couple of snide comments. But they were listening to almost everything I said. Mum wanted the details. No mum. I'm still your Harry. I've just had some good luck for once. Mum had hardly left me alone since she hugged me and wanted to know about my transformation. A few months ago, I discovered a formula that is going to change the world, and Jack and Norman have been helping me do what they call a patent, meaning that people have to pay me to use my formula. Mum was astounded. But that's not all. Norman and I have set up a new company to produce the compounds that my patent protects, and he's given me a 30% stake in the company. He's got a 30% stake in the company. We also gave Jack a 1% shareholding, and some international investors have the remaining 39%. So everything is leaning toward it being a huge success. Dad had a scowl on his face. I think he wanted to say something but said nothing. Greg, for the first time in his life, he couldn't say anything to me. It's only a little bit of money coming in now. However, over the next couple of years, I think I could be worth quite a bit, and I get to travel to interesting places to do research. I had left my parents speechless for the first time, and my family had nothing to say. It wasn't praised as I got from Jack, but neither was it insults and berating like normal. That week, I went back to work and study happy, and you couldn't wipe the smile off my face. Each month, I would head back to lunch with my parents, and it was different. Of course, I wasn't entirely included, Joan, Greg and dad never had any more time for me than they ever did, but mom and a few of the family friends appeared to be interested in what I was doing. Then one Sunday, I turned up, and mom appeared nervous. I hugged her, acknowledged without too much warmth my siblings and father, and went to say hello to the day's guests. As I mentioned before, mom and dad always had different people on Sundays, and today was no exception. I mingled for a bit. I grabbed a plate of food and went and sat down in my usual spot out of the way to enjoy my barbecue cooked sausages, potato salad, crusty bread rolls, and people watch for a while. While I was not as socially awkward as I used to be, I still didn't interact that well with this crowd of people, especially those my parents hung around. Hi, mind if I sit here? It was as if I had heard the voice of an angel. I repositioned my gaze, and there she stood. If I appreciated my Camaro's color, forms, and curves, then the vision before me made my car pale in comparison. She was tall and thin, looking like just a bit under six inch. She had long soft brown hair that was almost down to her waist, her waist was tight, and she looked like she had an amazing hips under the jeans she was wearing. Her face was cute, big brown eyes, a button nose and soft lips, she wore big thick-rimmed glasses, but they added to the look of her face. I think she had spoken to me a moment ago. Ah, sorry, she giggled. I think she knew I was caught staring. Do you mind if I sit here? I wanted to sit and eat. Sure, I'm Harry. Diana. Over the next hour. We talked about everything we could think of, from current movies and tastes in music to some of my chemistry work in cars like my Camaro. Diana was at college learning counseling to become an abuse counselor, loved dogs, not cats, was a fan of sci-fi movies, and was into console gaming. She lived about half an hour out of town, surprisingly on my way back to my unit, and I must say by the time I had to go, I was smitten. We were still chatting when Mum came out looking for me. Harry? Yes, Mum? Locating me and walking over to where Diana and I were sitting, she saw Diana and hesitated. Diana, how are you, sweetie? They exchanged pleasantries, apparently. Diana had worked for Dad recently, which is how she got invited. Harry, I was wondering if you could do me a favor. Diana's lift had to leave early because of a family situation, and as you're going by her house on the way home, I was wondering if you could drop her off for me? Sure, Mom. 
That's if Diana doesn't mind riding with me. She put a hand on my arm. I'd love to, Harry. Mum looked relieved. I suppose she wouldn't need to ask someone to go out of their way to drop Diana off. Twenty minutes later, I was ready to leave, and Diana was happy to leave with me. I hugged Mum, and as I walked out, waved to Dad. For the first time, he smiled at me and waved back. Weird. Diana was suitably impressed with the ride in my Camaro, and we continued to talk back to her place. Finally, she directed me to a small unit complex similar to the one I lived in my first days away from my parents. It's not much. Two girls and I share a three-bedroom flat. We all chip in and get by. I would be the last to judge until recently. I lived in something similar, but just one bedroom and no flatmates. She looked over at me, and I could see she wanted to say something as we were sitting in my car. I had a nice time this afternoon. For the most part, your family don't hold you in a favorable light. But this afternoon I saw someone who cared enough about his family that despite the gap between you, you came anyway. Diana, that's one of the nicest things that anyone has ever said to me. There was an awkward silence as the conversation tapered off for the first time in hours. We both knew that Diana needed to head inside, but she was hesitant. Diana, yes, um, I wanted to ask her out, but I had no idea how. I'd never been attracted to a girl before, and I suppose that no girl had ever paid attention to me. Next Friday, she said. Next Friday? Yes, Harry. You were trying to ask me out next Friday to go and see the new Marvel movie, weren't you? She was looking at the dashboard of my car, just a little demurely, blushing and giving me the opportunity that I wanted and felt had been growing all evening. Yes, Friday. We exchanged numbers, emails and the usual things. And I wanted to kiss her goodnight, but I settled for an awkward hug. I drove home, and though I didn't sleep a wink, I was floating on air at my lecture in the morning and work in the afternoon. Finally, after a couple of hours, Norman pulled me aside. Harry, would I be right in assuming that you have met someone? Blushing, it just all came out of me. Yeah, Norman, she's beautiful. I met her at my parents. Her name is Diana. She's studying at college and lives not too far away. Friday night, we're going to go and see a movie. Norman thought it was cute. Puppy love. He kept mentioning for the rest of the week. He kept me focused, though. Mistakes in the lab could cost a lot of money, but my process could have explosive consequences if done incorrectly. Diana and I spoke on the phone a couple of times that week, and when Friday afternoon came, I was nervous, so I called Jack. He had talked to Norman, so he had an idea of what I was going through. For the first 10 minutes, I gave him Diana's rundown and my conversation and told him I was worried I'd screw up my first ever date. He laughed, it's okay Harry, some nerves show that you like the girl, but you're going to a movie, so it's not going to be too awkward. For most of the time you will be focused on the movie. So wear your really good dark blue jeans, that white shirt and white sneakers we bought you a while ago. Don't forget to brush your teeth and wear deodorant. Just be your usual charming self. You'll do fine. But I'm not charming. Harry, I don't think you see it. But the girls check you out all the time. You don't see it. Just yesterday, a couple of the lab tech girls kept their eyes on you as you walked up and down the lab. Between your evolving dress sense, being a young guy driving a Camaro, and the confidence you have in your work, trust me, they notice you. It sounds like this Diana has noticed and wants to stake a claim before someone else does. That just made me more nervous. That night as promised, I picked Diana up at 7. We drove straight to the moves for the 7.30 session. We both loved the movie. Marvel always do well with the story, how the film connects, their special effects. This one also had quite a bit of humor, so we laughed a lot. In one hilarious scene where the main character got caught literally with his pants down by his love interest before he could turn invisible, Diana reached over and grabbed my hand. She was laughing so hard. When the scene was over, she left her hand in mine. I really couldn't complain. However, I think we might need to see the movie again as my attention ended up being split between the screen and my hand held by Diana. After the movie, still holding hands, we walked to a cafe just outside the cinema. Diana dragged me over and we sat down and ordered Italian hot chocolates. If you have never had one, you need to, and they are divine. Think of a thick chocolate shake only made out of hot chocolate. It's warm and so thick you can stand a spoon in it. We started talking about the movie we just watched, the potential sequels, then we moved more into personal territory, speaking about what we wanted in the future from our jobs, we talked about my car. I went out on a nervous first date lib and complimented her on how beautiful she looked, dressed in dark jeans with a light blue blouse and navy pumps, her hair was brushed to a sheen and tied back, and she had a pair of thin-framed glasses as opposed to the thicker ones that just fit like her larger ones. However, what made my evening was that we discovered that we had a shared passion, people watching. Have you ever just sat and watched the people around you, how they walk, 
what actions they take as they react to the objects and people around them. We found we love to people watch and make up silly stories as we watch people walk around. One couple, we pretended that they were Russian spies trying to gain intelligence about our little town. Another older couple were hurrying back before the curfew at the retirement home, or the head warden would put them on rations. Another young couple walked hand in hand, kissing every few meters, and they were Romeo and Juliet from opposing houses but finding love. We laughed and smirked, and I thought we had a great evening. After such a great evening, I didn't want to head home, but it was getting late, so we drove back to her place. Again, I got out, came around and opened her door. She got out and hugged me, but she then surprised me and gave me a light and quick kiss on the lips, but the effect was instantaneous. Diana giggled and stood away. Harry next Friday. Yes? You're taking me out next Friday. Oh yes, you've got it. Undomesticated equines could not keep me away. She laughed, getting the reference instantly. The next few months saw together almost every weekend and even a few evenings a week. We spent a lot of time talking, holding hands and quite a few chaste kisses. I got to meet her flatmate, Cindy, a slightly older lady. She was blonde and well-endowed but dressed conserved and Dawn, a small and mousy brunette, pretty much kept to herself. I got the opportunity to introduce Diana to Norman, show her around the office, and met a few of the lab team. I noticed a few of the girls started a little longer than was polite as I introduced Diana around. Perhaps Norman was right, and Diana was staking a claim. We tended to travel together a lot. She had a little old Datsun, so we often went everywhere together in my Camaro. I bought us both pairs of aviators, with hers being prescription. Diana was a little perplexed and felt guilty because the cost was close to $300. However, I think I was falling hard for her and wanted to pamper her a little. Diana, let me buy these for you. What very few people know is that I have quite a bit of money between my patent royalties and the business that Norman and I have. Buying you some sunglasses so you can ride with me is not going to affect my bank balance. And we did look good in our matches aviators getting out of the Camaro if I say so myself. I would say we had been hanging out almost two months, really enjoying each other's companies, when the dynamic between us changed again. It was a Sunday as opposed to Saturday family lunch at my parents' house. We both sitting in our usual spot, just out of the way of everyone, and we were engaging in our favorite pastime of people watching. At the same time, we ate a little food when Greg came over to us, waving a newspaper in front of our faces trying to get everyone's attention because he thought he had something that might embarrass me. Hey mistake, what's this? He said waving the paper in front of me. It must be wrong because you are a mistake. He laughed at his poor joke, but what he thought was funny made Diana's day. She grabbed the page and frowned while she read it a moment, then smiled like a sunrise, looking over at me and winking. This could be interesting. Greg, this newspaper article you're referring to thinking to embarrass your brother, she swatted the page with her hand, is a feeder article to a much larger piece that New Business Magazine is doing on an innovative young entrepreneur getting attention all around the world. So why would the mistake be mentioned? Did he screw up? So the paper put his photo in as a way to highlight his stupidity. He was laughing at his joke. However, everyone else wasn't laughing. I think they may have sensed that this was not going to go Greg's way. I sat saying nothing, but a big grin was growing on my face moment by moment. Actually, she paused for effect, Harry is the focus of not only the newspaper but the full article. I was there when they came to his office and interviewed him. Although the amount of time that they referred to him as the hottest young entrepreneur on the planet was a little embarrassing, she was proud. And what I find cool is that Harry, my boyfriend, she almost yelled the name, is being honored not only for his discoveries in the scientific realm, but the cleverness putting worth over $10 million in under a year. Everyone stopped. Pretty much everyone's jaws dropped. Greg wasn't sure what had just happened. My mother had a combined look of shock and pride. My father just stared. The family friends around were doing double takes and were looking at me, trying to reassess everything they had heard about me. Diana had a big shit-eating grin looking like the cat that swallowed the canary. Me, I was shocked. My big grin from seeing Greg embarrassed was replaced quickly with a look of total shock. I had just been called someone's boyfriend. It took everyone more than a moment as we all absorbed different information. Then, in the center of it all, Diana looked at me and smiled, pushing her glasses up on her nose, looking like the most intelligent person in the room. To me at that moment she was. Then I was the focus of everyone's attention as everyone wanted to know everything about the article. Finally, someone took the newspaper and read it out loud and the question started. I explained that my patent around the creation and recycling of plastic, and the business that Norman and I had begun to create the compounds using a formula based around the patent, was getting international attention. 
Big Business was buying our product as fast as possible to test it and see if it held up to claims. I knew that when it worked, then we would need to expand capabilities in several countries drastically. The interrogation was relentless that afternoon. Everyone wanted to know how much I was making, was going to be famous, was an opportunity for them to be a part of my business. My family was mixed. When I described the money and opportunity, they all lit up. However, when I told everyone that investment comes later and that jobs were only for people trained in the industry, they all looked crestfallen. Dad, in particular, had gone from the shook bad to his usual scowl when it came to me. I suppose he thought he was entitled to my discoveries and money just because he was my father. The one funny one was that Jones suddenly started to pay me attention. I guess she thought I was worth something or could give her money for nothing because she was my sister. Honestly, though, while I wasn't above helping out family, I didn't want to provide them with anything. They had treated me as a second-class citizen growing up. They weren't poor with dad's construction business, so in my mind, they could keep their money and I would keep mine. There were a couple of other things of note that afternoon. The first one was that when the excitement died down, Diana came and sat on my lap and planted the biggest kiss I have had in my entire life on me. This wasn't the little pecks on the lips that we had been giving each other, but a full lip lock. I felt a thrill when her lounge danced with mine. After she pulled back, keeping an arm around my neck and looked into my eyes, with a look that I could only describe as sultry. I was only 19, and Diana was not even six months behind me. Never having been with a girl before, now I was taken. I'm your boyfriend, eh? Yes, silly, she said, looking back at me. You are my boyfriend, and I'm your girlfriend. I smiled up at those big brown searching eyes and pulled her in for another kiss. It was only my second serious kiss and damn, I think I loved kissing. While we had been holding hands a lot, from that moment, any time that Diana and I were in the same room together, you could look at us and see there was always a part of us touching. It didn't make sense to me at the time. However, something else significant that happened that afternoon followed not long before Diana and I left. Everyone pitched in, helping to clean up. Usually, that meant the guys cleared dishes away, put rubbish in the bins, and straightened up. Usually, I wiped down the tables and took the garbage collected over to the bins, and today was no exception. Diana had gone in to help rinse and stack the dishwasher, and when I came in it, it looked like Mom, Dad and Greg were all talking to her. She seemed slightly flushed and caught my eye but said nothing more of it. When I walked over, Mom and Diana glanced at me, then Dad and Greg just walked away. I lead Diana over to the other side of the room, away from everyone else. What's wrong, D? For a moment, she hesitated, then looked deep in my eyes. Nothing that you need to worry about now. But you're worried. Did my parents say something to upset you? Again, she slightly hesitated then nodded. For a moment, she thought, then looking down at her hands, she again spoke to me. Yes, at the core of it was that they didn't like that I announced your success and that I shamed Greg in front of everyone. They don't think of you the same way I do. To them, you're a failure, but if you were going to be successful, they wanted to be on their terms, and I think your Roger thinks he should be in charge of your money. I frowned, well, Greg did that to himself, and he should have thought about it before opening his mouth. However, he's always been that way. He calls me the mistake because mom and dad were not expecting to have me, he and Joan were planned, I wasn't. He's never liked it any time that I was put in the spotlight. And not only did you announce the articles and how successful the business that Norman and I are creating is, but you also announced yourself as my girlfriend. She blushed at that. I drew her hand in and kissed it. As for dad thinking that I should acknowledge him as the reason for my success and let him run my money, that is never going to happen. Outside of Jack and Norman, no one has shown an interest in me or my success until you. But now I also have the challenge to look after someone I am quite taken with so I'm going to work hard to be the boyfriend that you need. Oh, Harry. She fell into my lap then while pushing me down on the couch. Mum watched from over in the kitchen, but didn't say anything. Sitting in my lap, Diana put her arms around me and put her head to my chest. She may have cried a little. I don't know. The next few months were like a dream. Diana and I spent as much time together as possible. She was starting to come to my place a whole lot more, and we had some tremendous make-out sessions. I even got to feel her up a little, and she liked it. However, I don't think we were ready. Sex was likely in our future, perhaps even our near future, but not just yet. On the business front, things were getting hectic. The plastic compounds we were making were becoming more and more in demand, and I started needing to travel. A lot of the companies purchasing our product wanted to meet me, the young inventor. Some of the travel was domestic around the country. However, some of it was also international. Often Norman came with me, and we hired a PR firm that sent various consultants with us. Large manifesting companies were falling over themselves to meet with us, 
and I was shouted to big fancy restaurants for excellent meals. I also got to stay in some fancy hotels at the client's cost. I talked through our patented process in meetings, demonstrated how our compounds would work in manufacturing, and gave extraordinary PowerPoint presentations. Each meeting was successful, and Norman was happy as everyone wanted to keep placing orders. I looked forward to coming home each time through, as I missed Diana. When I was traveling, we tried to do a Skype call every couple of days, and I could tell she was missing me as much as I missed her. I took lots of photos of the cities that I visited, and she loved seeing the hotel rooms I got to stay in as well. She had never really traveled. So having a boyfriend who got to travel was both exciting and depressing for her. I was hoping that in the future, we would be able to travel together. My travel also meant that we missed the next three months of family gatherings. She noted that she only wanted to go if I was with her. I sensed something in the background there. Both of us were always invited. However, if I wasn't there, Diana always had a reason that she couldn't go. One of the really exciting things was that during our trips is that our investment team assisted us in securing facilities, allowing us to begin manufacturing in three new countries, the effect expanding the business exponentially. When we got home from the trip that brought us our third site for Norman and I, along with our senior team, worked our bum off for two weeks straight, all B-days and no time off at all. This included weekends. It was a busy time, but everyone knew that we would all be set for life if we got everything set up right. So, we arranged that our head office would be the central lab and research center, while our overseas offices would manufacture our compounds for release into the local markets. This allowed us to maintain control and manage local market conditions rather than create everything and ship compounds worldwide. As we were working on everything, Diana regularly brought me lunch, and often she would sit with me in my office or with me in the company lunchroom. We, unfortunately, didn't get to see each other much during this time. Even once we got the management structure out in the initial two week time frame, I was still pulling significant hours, sometimes up to 20 hours a day. Finally, by the end of the third week of extra time on work, bringing it five weeks since I had gotten home, Diana and I hadn't even had a date. Finally, she had enough and arranged with Norman for me to have Friday night and Saturday off. She didn't tell me and let Norman inform me, and he chuckled when I started to protest. Harry, that girl adores you. She's been trying to see you every day since we got back and you need to see your girlfriend. She knows that you're busy and this is important. But Harry, she needs to know she's important to you as well. Take the evening off and tomorrow and spend time with her. Hells, you work harder than anyone. Make sure you take the next few days. We have got everything in order and the work will always be there when you get back. He gave me a crooked eyebrow and a bit of a smile. And make sure to give her some of the gifts you bought for her. Let her know how special she is to you. So, that evening actually, I did a bit more than that. I let Diana know I would be home at a reasonable hour and gave her a time to meet me at my apartment. When she turned up that evening, she melted into my arms and kissed me as if her life depended on it. Baby, I have missed you so much. Lunch at your office doesn't cut being able to hold you. She perked up and pulled back. So, where are you taking me tonight? Sydney. Sydney? Where's that? I grinned. You know Sydney the city? Sydney, Australia? I should have told you earlier. However, we live in Melbourne, which is in Australia. A trip to Sydney was something that we had never done. She looked at me, and I could see that she wanted to burst out and scream. A trip away? Just the two of us. D, I've missed you so much. I agree with the lunch visits and flying in and out. I just want some us time. You and me? I must have said the right thing because I was being attacked and mauled. My beautiful girlfriend kissing me all over the next thing I knew. When are we leaving? Now. But Harry, I can't. I have no clothes. I produced a packed suitcase from behind the couch. I picked this suitcase up for you overseas and dropped by your place before coming home this afternoon and had one of your flatmates, Cindy, pack you some clothes. She looked awed, and her eyes held nothing but love. I continued. I bought it for you. So hopefully in the future, you can travel with me now and then when I have to. I missed you so much that Norman had to talk me down from coming home early twice on that last trip. I looked at her and drew in a deep breath. D, I've got to confess, I'm in love with you. Looking down at my feet. I didn't move for a moment, just continuing to stare at my feet. She didn't say anything, and I had no idea if I had just said the wrong thing and might have to go to Sydney alone. I slowly looked up at Diana and on her face was a giant smirk that I have seen. She lifted her hand to caress my cheek, a tear in her eye. Harry, I love you too. The kiss, when it came, started slow, arms around each other, our lips softly meeting, tongues exchanged, and I could feel warm tears against my cheek. I was again floating just like that first kiss all those many months ago, and I knew that she loved me. 
just as much as I loved her. We need to go. I have arranged everything for the next few days, just you, me, and nothing else. We caught an Uber to the airport, jumped on the one-hour-long flight to Sydney. We sat in business class. The hostess brought us champagne, and we sipped it together. Neither of us liked champagne, but we enjoyed the experience of sharing it on a plane. It was Diana's first time on a place as well, and she was curious about everything. Take off and landing, staring out the window, even using the bathroom. A corporate car waited for us as we disembarked, and the driver who was booked exclusively to us for the duration of our trip took care of our luggage and drove us into town. He dropped us off at Darling Harbor, where we dined upstairs in an upscale restaurant with beautiful views. Diana was smiling all the time. We tried a few different dishes, enjoyed a couple of drinks and enjoyed ourselves. After dinner, we took a walk along the harbor and strolled hand in hand along the boardwalk. Harry, she stopped as we watched one of the ferries dock, its passengers disembarking. I could feel this was going to be a serious chat. Yes, my love. She sighed. You have no idea how much I love hearing that, but I don't know if I deserve it. We walked over to a bench that overlooked the waters and sat down. This was going to be a serious conversation. Harry, I know I don't speak a lot about my past. The reason is that my upbringing was not a happy one. Both of my parents are dead, and I never had any brothers or sisters. Up until a year before I was, I was 18, I was a ward of the state, and that time wasn't a highlight of my life. I nodded. I had never asked because she changed the topic pretty quickly the couple of times I did try to ask. She continued. There is a lot of darkness back there. I was pushed into doing things that I didn't want to do and things that I am not happy about. Tears were forming in her eyes. Harry, you are my first love, the first boy that I ever cared anything about, and when I am with you, I feel wanted, desired, and that perhaps the dark things I mention of my past may not be the path of my future. But Harry, I don't deserve your love. Her tears were falling hard now. I don't deserve it as you are the purest and honest man I know. You give me everything. This trip, in my mind, I never expected anything like this. I was content to be yours in our little town. But you make time for me even though you have the most amazing career and fortune ahead of you. But I am damaged, broken, and I don't deserve you. I think she wanted to say more, so I decided to give her a bit of confidence. Diana, it is okay. I get that you don't want to talk about your past. I understand that there are some dark things there, which is why I never pushed. But the challenges that you have made it through have made you who you are, the woman I am in love with. We've known each other for over a year and have been dating almost that long. I can tell you that there is nothing that you can tell me that would make me love you any less. Do you need to bury a body? I'll get a shovel, got gambling debts, and I'll go pay them off? I love you, Diana Brown, wholly and completely. She broke down even further. I pulled her in close and went to kiss her, reassure her that I didn't care, but she pushed me back and stood, anger flashing in her eyes. No, Harry, my beautiful, amazing Harry, I don't deserve your love. I'm not pure, she sobbed more. Finally, I was beginning to feel I had an understanding of what she was trying to say. D, it is okay. No, it's not Harry, I'm broken, unclean, and I can't give you the one thing in this world that I want to. She almost crumped to the ground, sobbing and so quietly I almost didn't hear it. I'm not a virgin. I knew now this is what she was upset about. She didn't want to talk about something in her past and knew that I had no relationships before her. So I had not lost my virginity, but she had. I sat down on the ground beside her and put my arm around her as she cried. I thought about what she said as she cried, heaving big sobs of someone who believes they have lost something fundamental to them. People passed us sitting on the ground, a man holding a woman, some asked if we were okay, most just walked around us looking at us but not wanting to get involved. Finally, after a while, I helped her return to the seat. Diana, from the first moment I met you, I was smitten. You know I never really had any friends. My family saw to that and always made sure to mistreat me at any point that they could legally get away with it. My sister ignored me. My older brother beat me as often as he could till I had black and yellow bruises all over my body. Then, when they would heal, he would do it again. My father openly scorned me, and my mother never defended me. She looked up at me, concerned for me in her eyes. Anytime the family went out, if they could leave me at home, they would. If they didn't have to pay for me, they wouldn't. I was only ever giving Greg's hand-me-downs for everything and they made me do three times as much household work for half the pocket money that my brother and sister had to if I got anything at all. If I didn't get it right, my father would take the belt to me and leave me sore for days. Diana was now looking at me, scared and a little angry, her brow creasing with worry at what I was saying. I have never spoken aloud to anyone what I have just told you. 
I never trusted anyone enough to give them the truth. Anytime someone got close to the truth, I defended my family and their actions. I don't know why, but I did. D. You are under the impression that I would discard you because of your confession. However, I love you more than I did a moment ago. Although you told me something you didn't want to, you took a chance to try and open yourself up to me. I know you don't want to tell me everything, and for now, that's okay. I trust you, that you're not a virgin, and I am fine with that. I didn't know before you told me, but I live in the real world and know that virginity at our age in today's society is rare, so I had no expectation one way or the other. I love you, Diana, and your revelation makes not a bit of difference to me. We are here this weekend because I love you. I am not going anywhere, and I hope that you're going to stay here with me and perhaps a lot longer. My little speech and not giving a damn about her background or her virginity brought a new wave of tears. She held me tight and whispered, It's not fair. I don't deserve you. Along with, I love you. For another half hour or so. It was like a bubble around us. Nothing else mattered as we held each other tight. When we stood up, I don't think I could have pried her from my side if I wanted to. She produced some tissues from her purse and dried her tears, and we walked to a bathroom so she could fix her makeup. I thought she looked beautiful but she wanted to feel like she wasn't red and blotchy. Once she felt better and came out of the bathroom, we resumed our walk along the harbor boardwalk and found a little gelato place, both of us enjoying a shared cup of cookies and cream. It was nearing 11 at night, and I felt it was time for us to head indoors, so I got out my phone and called our driver. I had booked a three-bedroom suite for us at one of the fancy hotels near the famous Sydney Opera House. It overlooked the water and had a surrounding view of the harbor bridge and the opera house. As we entered the suite, we were both taken by the view. We looked in all the rooms, sat down on the couch in the main room, and made out for a while. Kissing her is an experience that I never want to take for granted, and I let my love for her flow through the connection of our lips. I knew that soon we would have to address the sleeping arrangements, but Diana beat me to it. Harry, would it be okay if we slept in the same bed tonight? I have had the most amazing night, both happy and sad, but tonight I just want you to hold me as I sleep. I want to feel safe and helped by the man I love. I hesitated only a moment. My only concern was that I could not keep my hands off her. I would not have it any other way. We retied to the enormous master bedroom. Both of our suitcases were already in the master, our driver just assuming that we would be sleeping together. I grinned. I was going to get to sleep beside the person I loved more in this world than anyone else. If I was fortunate, I might get to feel her up or maybe get a glimpse of something more. Diana grabs a few things from her bag went into the bathroom and threw a kiss at me while closing the door. I slipped into some cotton boxers and crawled into the bed, and what a bed it was. With the business, I have stayed in several hotel rooms, and some nice ones. Still, one thing that always gets me is that hotels will advertise a king bed as part of a room. Still, it's two singles put together with a mattress proctor over the top to make it like a king bed, and they are annoying as there is a gap in the middle. This bed was a proper king mattress with high-thread cotton sheets that felt like they had been hand-washed not gone through a commercial laundry. There was a range of pillow options, from big fluffy pillows that you would sink into all the way to firm pillows that never changed shape. I tried a few different pillows when the door opened, and I forgot all about pillow choice. The woman of my dreams was standing there, highlighted by the soft bedside lamps and the bathroom light behind her. She had a massive grin on her face, and her long thin legs bare up to a pair of sheer black panties that had floral embroidery hiding all the right places. Her torso was exposed, showing me her tight abs. Continuing upwards, she had a tiny semi-transparent nightie on, but it stopped a little below her breasts. Right now, I was drooling at her body. She raised her arms in the doorway and posed, moving her hips to the side, accentuating her woman's features. See anything you like? My words escaped me, and I was still stuck on her body, going from her eyes to her tits and then down to her panties where I could almost see through it. She laughed and fell into bed beside me our arms automatically going around each other as another round of passionate kisses occurred. But unlike other times, our hands roamed over each other. Do you trust me, baby? She asked, looking into my eyes. With my life. She smiled, removed her glasses placing them on the nightstand and moved down the bed. It was not long before we made love for the first time. It was amazing. We cuddled for a while, then Diana suggested we shower together, which was yet another experience that I savored. I soaked most of her body, running my hands all over her. We also had our first shower sex together. Later after cleaning up in the shower again, we dried off and walked back into the bedroom. Diana frowned. We might have to call and get the sheets changed. There is almost a puddle in the middle of the bed. I laughed a little, thinking back to our antics. 
Let's worry about that in the morning, my love. There are another two bedrooms here. We pulled the sheets down to let the master bed dry and walked naked into the spare room across the hall, jumped into bed and snuggled up against each other. Love you, I said as I began to drift off. Love you, Diana said, holding me tight. I woke the next morning to a warm body beside me, an arm over my torso. She was still asleep, and I noticed snoring quietly. I moved, and she began to wake. So I rolled over and stared at her while she worked up and opened her eyes. Good morning, my love. Good morning, Mr. Morning Breath, she giggled. While we had washed last night, neither of us cleaned our teeth afterwards, so kissing was to a minimum. However, it didn't stop us. We fooled around a little. However, we were both hungry, and we did brush our teeth before getting dressed and heading out the breakfast. Watching Diana getting dressed for the day was like watching art being created. I'm going to tease you all day, is all she said. We headed out, let reception know our room needed changing and headed out to find a cafe, have something to eat, and people watch. We found a little independent cafe, found it had great coffee and a decent menu and sat down to people watch and enjoy the day. Sitting side by side, Diana never let her hand, never strayed far from mine as we enjoyed it. Honey, I hope you know you rocked my world last night. I laughed, just as you rocked mine. No, Harry, I'm serious. I know I told you I'm not a virgin, and I've had sex twice before last night, she blushed. It was not pleasant. Then, she paused for a moment, but last night, you showed me what it was to make love truly. You made me feel special like the only woman on the face of the planet and I got to do things and feel things that I have never thought I would ever feel. I grinned. She blushed a deeper shade of pink. I was curious, so I asked, like what? She took another sip and looked at her coffee before looking back at me. Well, I have never gone down on someone before. However, I felt so special doing that for you, and will do it again. She was struggling to voice this, but I was loving how awkward it was making her. She pressed on. Harry, also, I have never gushed like that before ever, not even by myself. Then, again, she paused, baby, you were amazing and I couldn't get enough of you. I love how you gave me everything. To me, you were a virgin again and I was glad I got to take you. Leaning over, she kissed me tenderly and we finished our late breakfast and walked around the city for the rest of the morning. I then called our driver and 20 minutes later we were on a tour of Sydney. He took us to the opera house, we walked around, got selfies and had a great time. He took us to the Harbor Bridge and managed to get us in just in time for a bridge climb, an experience where you get to climb up the bridge over the top of traffic. Diana and I had a brilliant day. We got dropped back to the hotel room and made love in the spare bedroom, learning more about each other's bodies and what we did and didn't like. I found out more about her erogenous areas and how to make sure she had almighty orgasms. We showered together, washing each other head to toe, and as we went to get dressed, I stopped Diana from getting anything out of her suitcase. Standing naked, she looked at me. I have a surprise for you. I went to the robe and brought out a suit bag, zipping it open. I brought out a little black dress and matching shoes and clutch that I had bought for her in Paris when Norman and I were there for business last month. It was a designer label. It took me over an hour of going through photos of you with the salesperson speaking poor English to get her size before I was happy with the purchase. She was shocked but pleased. She put on some black panties and then I helped her into the dress. She was shining and twirled around admiring herself before heading to the bathroom to do hair and makeup. Harry, this must have cost a fortune. You know you didn't need to. I wanted to, D. I have the money, so I don't mind spoiling the people I love, people who will appreciate it, not demand it. Demand it? Do you mean like your family? It was the first dark cloud of the day, and I frowned as I brought out my suit bag with a new suit that was made to match her dress. Yes, I didn't think you knew about that. They have been getting pushier asking for money from me, Joan keeps sending me text messages, and Dad leaves voicemails as I wouldn't say I like talking to him. But, he believes that they are the reason I am successful, so he feels that I need to give them their dues. Diana tried not to frown as she was applying eye makeup, eyeliner, I think they call it. Your father and sister have both tried calling me while you have been traveling. I've gotten voice messages with them asking me to convince you to help them with one thing or another. They haven't yet been directly threatening, but I have avoided calling them back and I am not looking forward to the next visit out to their place. It's why I don't want to go there without you. Your mother is nice, your sister doesn't seem to care much, but your father and brother. It's okay, babe, I do understand. You heard some of the things that I had to put up with growing up with last night while we talked, I get it. She stopped and came over to me, looking in my eyes and giving me a gentle kiss. You are one of the bravest men I know, Harry Other. 
I know I have a hard time talking about my past, and perhaps one day I will be able to talk about it. But in some ways, you have had it worse than me. We finished getting dressed, and we had a car waiting to take us to an upper-class French restaurant. And later, I had arranged tickets to a symphony at the opera house, but she didn't know. At dinner, Diana ordered a fancy salmon dish, poached and with superb tender greens. I ended up having a steak with burnt butter sauce and excellently crafted vegetables. We finished our dinner and were contemplating dessert when one of the waiters walking by accidentally dropped an ornately carved box that looked like it held jewelry from the period when there was French royalty. I was instantly out of my seat, asking if the waiter was okay and helping him pick up everything and help him on his way. He acted a little embarrassed but was otherwise fine. Most of the restaurant had stopped to watch the commotion and saw Diana get out of her seat and move to help as well. The waiter moved away and then turned to watch what would happen next as I stayed kneeling and turned around, holding the small box open with a diamond ring inside. Everyone in the restaurant suddenly held their breath and Diana gasped. Diana Brown, from the day I met you, you have captured my heart. You make me want to be a better man. Your smile lights my way and your hands holding mine makes me feel like there is nothing in this world that I can't do. This past year has shown me that my soul belongs to you, and I would be ever so honored if you would consent to be my wife. For just a moment, everyone held their collective breath, and she looked at me. Then she remembered to breathe. Yes, she screamed and threw herself to me, hugging me as I stood. I plucked the ring from the box, and she held out her fingers, allowing me to slide the engagement ring on her hand. Everyone cheered, and a round of applause sprang up. She beamed, looking between the ring and myself as the restaurant manager and the same waiter that dropped the ring box came over to us. He congratulated us and comped our entire meal in front of everyone, happy to see an accepted proposal. As he left, another couple came over and congratulated us, and for the next half hour, many people came over. I don't think I had seen Diana as happy before. The last couple coming over, though, made her gasp. One of her roommates, Cindy, walked over hand in hand with Jack. I had known, but Diana hadn't known that they had been dating for about a month. Jack had told me, and I was happy. They were only a few years apart in age, and they suited each other. Cindy gave Diana an enormous hug as Jack gave me a hug like a big brother. We sat back down at the table, and they joined us for dessert. Over a cheese and port dish, I let Diana know how I planned it all out and had Jack and Cindy fly in this afternoon to wait for my proposal. I then surprised the three of them that I had four tickets for tonight's symphony at the opera house with a limo waiting outside for all of us. It was a grand evening. I had my fiancé on my arm dressed to the nines, a man who I saw my best friend beside me and his new girlfriend as well. The symphony's music was amazing, and since we were all dressed up, we felt part of something bigger. Over the preceding years, when Diana and I traveled, we would attend a symphony in town. It was around one in the morning when the limo took the four of us back to the hotel, and we parted ways with Jack and Cindy heading to the room I had got for them and us to ours. I wonder if Jack's going to get lucky with Cindy tonight as much as you're going to, Mr. Diana then undressed. Taking everything off except her glasses and her engagement ring, she crawled onto the bed and bent over. I need some hard loving, Harry. I think the sun was starting to come up when we finished, and we once again needed to sleep in one of the spare rooms due to the mess we left in the master bedroom. We slept until almost noon, when a text message from Jack woke us up. Hey buddy, it's lunchtime. Are you two decent enough to come and join us before we fly home? I replied that we would be down in half an hour, and we kissed, got up, showered, dressed and packed. I called reception, and they sent someone for our bags, and we met with Jack and Cindy. Whoa, Diana, are you okay? Cindy had a slight look of concern for a moment as Diana used my help to sit down at the restaurant cafe in the hotel's lobby. We didn't get to sleep until around 5 this morning, and I am a little tender from Harry's attention. Cindy took a moment and then burst out laughing. Jack reached out with a clenched fist to me, and I gave him a fist bump. After that, we ordered some food, and the girls headed to the bathroom while Jack and I talked about it last night. After my first night, he made sure I was okay, drooping the words, Harry is the man, several times. We then got onto a chemistry discussion in my upcoming graduation from university. Although, when the girls got back, Cindy was looking at me with a bit of envy in her eyes and a whole lot of respect. When she whispered in Jack's ear, his eyes went wide, and he turned back to me, holy shit dude, was all he said. I have no idea what they said, but I felt like the man. We were excited to get married, and within a week of returning, we had set a date of just over six months later to get married. Diana also all but moved in once we got home. There were not many nights that she wasn't staying over, just now and then to help one of her soon-to-be former flatmates out while she moved things, 
We also spoke about her studies, and she chose to do her study remove to be near me. She became a little bit of a fixture around the office. She used the coffee table by my couch for her laptop and books, and while she slowed down her subjects, she still keeps high marks. It was also great as I had her travel with me a little too. While it was mainly for work, some of our clients and investors dote on Diana being with me and seeing the love of my life. I loved showing her some of the places I had been. We ended up making love in pretty much every city we visited. On the family front, it was quite a mixed reaction. We made sure that we went to the next family gathering following my proposal in Sydney, and we let them know that we were going to get married. Diana was very proud of showing off her simple yet elegant diamond engagement right. Everyone's reactions were varied. Mum was excited and couldn't help but smile. I even got a grudging congratulations from my father. Joan was surprisingly the most vocal of the group, heartily approving of our engagement, telling everyone that she'd love to see Diana make an honest man out of me. Oh honey, was Diana's reply to Joan down the bridge of her nose. With how funny your brother made me walk the day after he proposed, I can't tell you he's one hell of a big man. Joan pretty much spats her drink all over the table, and my moth blushed as no one liked to hear about their son's sexual prowess. My father and brother also went red, but I am not sure if it was anger and embarrassment. For the rest of the afternoon, Diana kept getting looked at by everyone. I was content to sit back and bask in the glory that my fiancé brought my way. It was one of the very few times that no one bothered me. Another fun thing was that I also got to graduate from university with my degree in chemistry. While I thought about doing postdoctoral work between the business and Diana, I didn't think I would have the time. Besides, I could always go back later to study. The company was booming. We had over 800 employees in eight locations around the world now. Here at home, we produced the main compound and then shipped that to the other plants to produce the special plastics we had become famous for. The patent I had made it difficult for other companies to produce the compound without paying me a fee, so I knew that Diana and I would never lack money. It was that front that became the only issue in the lead up to the wedding. My legal team was employed to look after my best interests, which included protecting my assets in marriage or the case of an accident. This meant that they wanted Diana to sign a pretty detailed prenup. While she was fine with it, surprisingly, my family were not. At the regular family gathering, we were all sitting around and talking about our upcoming nuptials. I was sitting on one couch with Diana, mum, and dad on another. Joan was sitting with her current boyfriend, Fred. This one was named, or I could have just made that name up. She had a different on every gathering these days. Greg sat alone in his armchair. I don't think there were too many girls out there who could put up with him. He was always self-righteous and thought he could not say or do anything wrong when it often went the other way. I think it was because my dad gave him everything and never pulled him up. Everyone except Diana and I were against the prenup. It's just not right, boy. You're marrying Diana and everything should be shared. A prenup is the rich man's way of keeping everything for themselves and never giving it to the little guy. My dad was saying, but dad, I am one of the rich. And it's not that I have anything to hold back from Diana, she squeezed my hand. However, you need to understand that the prenup is not just to protect me, but all of my employees. It makes sure that if anything happens to me that everyone, including Diana, is looked after. Dad looked upset. Besides, according to the terms of the agreement, Diana is well looked after in any event. So I would never hold anything back from her. Diana squeezed my hand again. Dad, Diana had taken to calling my parents mom and dad since we got engaged. I think it makes dad awkward, which is why she did it. I am 100% in Harry's court. I'm going to sign the prenup because I know that he will always look after me. I've got nothing to lose, and it's the right thing to do. She stared my dad down, and for a few moments, it was like there was an unseen conversation going on. If it were me, there would be no prenup. I'd just give her everything and walk away, Greg said with all his wisdom. Joan looked at Greg and said, God, you so stupid. I am not. Yes, you are. Whenever you open your mouth and call Harry a mistake, you make me wonder if he is or you were. Mum piped in before it got worse. Enough you too. This is ultimately between Harry and Diana. They will make the choices that are best for them. Dad got up, throwing his hands in the air and walked away. None of you gets it. Life sucks. As the weeks led up to the wedding, the invites went out and people accepted. There was a bit of a breakdown of various groups that we were involved with. There was the contingent of family and friends. I'd asked Jack to be my best man, and Diana asked Cindy to be her maid of honor. We had a lot of the staff from our office invited. This included a number of the managers from our overseas plants. Even a few government officials and some professional contacts from big business wanted to be seen at the wedding of a young professional like myself. We even had a couple of reporters that had requested to attend. 
our PR firm granted that if all the photos and stories were approved before they were published. Another significant investment we made was buying a block of land and starting construction on a house. It was a big seven-bedroom, two-story house, situated on 100 acres about 40 minutes' drive from the city and an hour from the office and our laboratory. It wouldn't be finished until a few months after our honeymoon, but it was going to be beautiful. The master was a massive amount of the top floor with big walk-in robes, and my favorite of a double shower with two separate shower heads and an overhead shower rose. In addition, we were getting a big kitchen and family room and a media room, study, and multiple car garage. Again, we planned big with the idea that we never wanted to sell. While I was doing well, we did end up taking a small mortgage on everything. However, that would be paid off in a few years if everything kept going well. I also upgraded my car. I was keeping my original Camaro, the thing was a classic, but I bought a new one. A 2020 GTR series Camaro, burnt orange with black racing stripes. This had over 500 horsepower and a 6-speed manual gearbox, and you could hear it coming long before you saw it. We bought a brand new Jeep JL series for Diana, with a hardtop removable roof and all the optional extras like seat and steering wheel warmers, a complete navigation package, and good boot space. With a new house, new cars, and our wedding looming soon, we were looking to settling into a good life with each other. Of course, not everything was perfect. We still disagreed. But were we able to talk it through and never went asleep angry with each other? For the honeymoon, I booked six weeks off. We planned a top of the line cruise from Sydney to Honolulu in one of the nicest suites on one of the nicest ships that sailed the Southern Hemisphere. What was better was that Diana was banned from devices and disconnected while on board the ship. After that, it was just going to be us. The months moved by at a lightning pace, and suddenly, it was time for me to get married. The wedding day was clear and warm. As I stood at the altar waiting for my bride, I felt the butterflies that I am sure that every man gets right before they tied the knot. Jack noticed. Don't worry buddy, there is always time to run, he laughed, and Greg standing beside him as one of my other groomsmen. Because you couldn't have a brother and not have him be there, chimed in. Yeah, mistake. Run now, and dad and I will take care of her and all your money for you, Jack elbowed him. Just then, the music started and Diana appeared. After a few minutes getting herself in order, she walked down the aisle on Norman's arm. As she had no living family, he had been overjoyed to accept the role of walking to me standing at the altar. Norman had one daughter that was a young teenager. He was dreading the day he had to do the walk and saw this as good practice. They both made it down without incident. As the ceremony progressed, we took our vows. When the minister asked if anyone objected, we heard a grunt just as we saw mom grab dad's hand and squeeze. But that was it, and we were married. The reception was terrific, Diana had played to my taste buds, and in place of a standard wedding reception buffet or set menu, she had hired some of the best pitmasters from all over the state. We had a barbecue off, three different crews had set up two days ago in a field that we hired just for the reception, and they brought seasoned smokers to create ribs, pulled pork, sausages, and wings. Along with sides of cornbread, slaw, and chili fries, it was a reception where almost everyone went home happy. Even my father would have to admit that the food was good. As the evening progressed, we cut the cake, performed the bridal dance, and did the rounds together and separately for a while. I spoke with everyone making a circuit around the room and Norman, and I even interviewed a reporter about how marriage would help us innovate. I have no idea what I said, but I am sure it was good because everyone was smiling. However, not long into my discussion with the reporter, I noticed that my parents made their way to my new wife. During the last part of the interview, the reporter thought I was missing my new bride as my eyes kept cutting to her as I focused on Diana talking to my parents. It was the only time that day that she looked upset. My father looked to be saying some harsh words, and my mother looked like she was trying to hold him back. I excused myself, walked over to them, and heard my father finishing his lecture at my new wife. Just don't you forget what you owe us, or I'll make sure that the boy does. I jumped in. Just what do you think my darling wife owes you, dad, and why would you need to make sure I know it? The three of them noticed us. Mum and Diana blushed. Dad looked like he was about to explode. But before he could, Mum jumped in. Your dad, who has had one too many to drink tonight, was expressing how we introduced you to, wow, nice save Mum, I thought. I was going to question it, but Diana looked at me embarrassed. There was more to the talk, but she asked me to let it go with pleading eyes. Not a problem, but if you will excuse us, Mum and Dad, we need to finish a couple of things and head off to say our goodbyes so this party can break up. Diana grabbed me, and we walked back to Norman where Jack, Cindy and Norman's wife June had joined him. We went through the traditional throwing of the bouquet, Cindy caught it. I slapped Jack on the back, 
but he smiled whispered to me he had already bought the ring. After our goodbyes, we climbed in the limo that work had hired for us, stood up through the sunroof and waved to everyone as we left. When we got to the hotel, I think I spent almost an hour helping Diana get out of her dress, but it was worth it. Now husband, were, were we? That night we made love consummating our marriage, but it was slow, and neither of us went for any record. We were both tired from a long day, but we fell asleep content and happy. The next day we flew to Sydney and were chauffeur to the cruise ship. We were classified as VIPs due to what we were paying, so we got aboard any time we wanted to and had people take care of everything for us. We decided to board early, and while everyone else was boarding and getting settled, I ordered us a couple of cocktails and sat down with Diana on our balcony. Our butler, yes, we had a dedicated butler just for us on this trip, delivered our drinks, and we relaxed just settling in. I thought it was an excellent time to address the end of the reception last night. D, are you okay? Last night at the reception, I felt like something was going on in the conversation with mom and dad. So I interrupted, but I'm out of the loop? Diana blushed, took a sip of her drink, took a deep breath and sighed. You're right, Harry, there was something there. But, unfortunately, it's not my place to say anything, it's theirs. But the part that you walked in on was your father pressuring me now we're married for you to give them part of your business. I don't want to lie to you, honey. They say that if I can convince you to do that, they will not tell you some secrets that they have that the belief will destroy us. But, still, you in particular. She held up a hand, I don't know everything, but I do know enough to know that it would hurt you. But as I said, it's not for me to say, it's them and telling you without them would cause us more harm. She looked a little downcast. I am sorry, my love, this is not how I wanted to start our honeymoon. Please understand that I love you so much that I am fighting for you against the ill will they have, particularly your father. I never want to see you hurt, so I will stand in the gap and hopefully, one day, they can tell you. I'd been married one day, and we were already into the heavy marriage territory of trust issues. But as we sat and sipped our drinks, I know in my heart that Diana loves me fully and completely. We sat for perhaps five minutes as I tried to rationalize my thoughts. On the one hand, my wife didn't want to tell me something because she was scared for me and thought telling me a partial truth that wasn't her story to tell would hurt me. On the other, she was my wife, and we needed to trust each other in everything. I decided that I would travel the more complicated path of trusting my wife even though it hurt. I can admit this makes me upset. There is a secret here that involves me, my family and somehow you're also involved, she nodded, and I sighed. However, D.I., I am going to trust you. I believe that you want the best for me, for us. I am a little fearful, but as long as you stay by my side and help, I will let you lead the way in this. She got up off her chair and came and sat on my lap and kissed me. My husband, my love, I am sorry to have to do this, but I want the best for you and tell you what I do know will cause more pain and not help. So I need a little time to get this sorted for you. Again she kissed me. But this is not the forum for such a conversation. This is our honeymoon, and I believe that you owe your new wife some ravishing. So I did. A little over an hour later, our initial lust satisfied and feeling a little better, the dark cloud of my family pushed back over the horizon, Diana and I walked hand in hand out and around the ship. At first, our butler, Phil, escorted us. Then, however, we excused him to explore ourselves. Those first few days were magical. We spent time sunning ourselves, hanging out in the spa. We took in shows, got into a few matches of shuffleboard and table tennis. The ship stopped at islands and we got guided tours of tropical locations. Dee had bought a sexy navy blue sports bikini, is sat tight on her toned body, and the bottoms pulled in a little tighter around her hips, exposing more flesh than a usual bikini but keeping her modest. I was a little jealous but proud seeing more than one guy, and even a few girls turned their heads to stare as she walked by. I must admit that the most fun we had were the evening-themed parties. Everyone would dress up to the theme, all white, back to school, Gatsby, great fun. We also got invited to dine with the captain as VIPs, then got a tour of how the ship ran behind the scenes. And of course, we made love. Every day at least twice a day, we made love. In fact, it was one of the shore days when we had come back from the beach and Diana had taken off her swimsuit that we both had an experience that we both loved. Loads of sex, I must say. For the rest of the trip, we were just a couple in love on their honeymoon. We spent most of our time together, and I don't know that I have ever had as much sex as I did while we were on that boat. When we disembarked in Honolulu almost a month later, we were tired but relaxed, feeling like a newly married couple. I had booked us two nights in an excellent hotel to end our trip, a penthouse loft with views back over the water and the city. 
The first day we slept and pretty much waited for the world to stop swaying. If you have ever been a sea for any time, when you get back to the land, the world sways back and forth as your body adjusts. Sleep helped a lot. Of course, holding the love of your life was also great. The second day, we hung out by the pool and spoke about what we would do when we got back. Diana was only a couple of subjects shy of completing her college degree, and she was hoping to spend some time looking for a job. She knew that she didn't need to work from what I made, but she also wanted to stay active, and she wanted to find a way to contribute before we settled down to have kids financially. Speaking of kids, we both agreed that we wanted them sooner rather than later, and that once we got home, Diana would go off the pill, and we would start trying and let nature take its course. We both felt we were old enough for kids and wanted to ensure we were still young enough when the kids left home to keep doing things together. We talked about completing our dream house, which was being worked on, and we would be able to move in in a couple of months. We loved the ideas of barbecues and our kids' birthday parties by the pool. That got Diana horny, and her maternal instinct started in. More sex for me. The next few months were amazing. We were loving being married, and we made love all the time. We also spent a lot of time with Jack and Cindy, Norman and June, the house was finished, and we moved in even though the pool and landscaping still needed to be done. Upon my return, we had more orders than ever at work, and all our sites were running at capacity. I was doing about a week a month away from home, two of those trips international on average. However, each time I traveled overseas, Diana came with me, unwilling to leave my side. Having the money helped to afford her to travel with me easily. During the day, while I worked at whichever site I was at, she would sit in my office and work on little projects designing for the house or emailing people in support forums using the benefits of our counseling course. She also talked to a lot of the admin staff on site. They were always friendly as it's never a bad thing to be on the good side of the boss's wife. Sometimes she would go and visit landmarks being driven around by one of our staff. We were having a ball, and in some ways, it was a continuation of our honeymoon. When we got home, we got to planning our lives. We still headed up to the monthly family gathering. However, we only got there once every few months, so busy was our schedule. Another notable thing was that Diana and I agreed to stop taking her birth control pills at the six-month mark after the wedding. We bought some pregnancy tests and then got to making a baby. A few weeks later, we were up in the family gathering. It was a quiet one with only family. It was also the first one we had been to in a while, and Diana knew I was feeling uncomfortable as we had told mom and dad we were thinking of having a baby, and they were giving both of us the third degree. Joan and Greg. We're just sitting back and watching, and I was getting tired of being put under the microscope by my family for everything. Every decision or choice that I had made was always the wrong one in their eyes. They had all the excuses. It was too early for us. We should focus on our careers. They thought having a child was not something we should be doing. Even Joan and Greg decided to say they thought we were stupid to consider kids early in our marriage. After a particular belittling series of comments from Greg about how I must be so small because I would need so long to have a child, I was already a pathetic husband, and how Diana must be with me for my money. I had enough. For years I had been taking shit from all of them. Nothing I ever did was good enough for this so-called family. It was time to go. I stood, pissed off that no one ever stood up for me unless it involved money. D, get your stuff together. We're leaving, everyone looked at me. I was suddenly the focus of everyone in the room. Where are you going, boy? The voice of my father asked, trying to be the authority in the room. I'm going home. Why would you want to do that? We're you family, he responded. I know he never really wanted me here. However, in his mind, I had to come and go on his terms. For once, I let my anger and disappointment in them shine through. I don't know that you are my family. Everyone looked shocked. Family care for one another. Sure they have a poke at each other now and then. They fight and disagree. But they are there for one another. This family has never stood by me on anything. Whenever I need something any of you, I said in particular, pointing at my father. You give me every reason why I can't do something. You belittle me and tell me life isn't fair. So I should give up and just do what you think I should, which is never in my best interest. Not once in my entire life have you ever helped me. I have never had a positive fatherhood experience with you. Instead, you shower love and affection on that a-hole when he is the largest screw-up I know. Starting to shout and now pointing at Greg while letting my eyes bore into my father. You give your little princess anything she wants. She just has to pout or pretend that she's upset, and you give in. I once had a great sister, however as she gets older, she becoming more and more a selfish bitch. She has no idea how the world works because daddy does everything for her. And you, I said now, not just pointing but glaring at Greg, have done nothing but beat be black and blue since I was a kid. 
I've learned that I could have gone to the police and had you in trouble with the law for years for what you did to me, mental and physical abuse. You're a bully of the worst kind who belittles others to hide his pathetic inadequacies. What was worse, I defended you to everyone and hid the evidence that covered my body. Just now, you question my manhood when you yourself can't hold a woman for more than a month. You know why they leave you. It's because you think you're God's gift to womanhood when that is far from the truth. In your mind, they're all wrong because your parents could do no wrong. Well, let me lay it out for you, big brother. You are a pathetic excuse of a man. Sure you have muscles, but you have no idea how to use them for your betterment. No idea that every word dropping out of your mouth makes you look like a total idiot and most of the people cringe the moment you open your mouth. Just now, you could do nothing but pour venom at me for some slight trying to tear me down. But just because your pecker is under 5 inches when it's hard, and mine is larger and longer than yours when soft does not excuse your poor and pathetic comments just now, grow up. I started looking at each of them. My family cares nothing for me. My sister and my mother could not care two shits about what happens to me. And the only time that Joan gives me any attention is when it comes to money. No one was saying anything. They were just staring at me as I continued my angry monologue. Talking of money, yeah, I have it. Do you know why I never give anything to any of you? Because again, you don't care. I put myself through university because you refused to pay anything. I stood up and created the business with Norman, and you told me I was an idiot. Yet once I was successful on my own merit, you think that you all deserve all the money that goes with it. You think because I have it that I should give it to you without any question. You all love money more than me. For you, in your pathetic minds, it's the only reason you keep me around thinking you might get some of it from me. As I understand, your little construction business hardly keeps you afloat as you live too big for your own capacity. So you keep asking for my money, you keep badgering Diana to make me give some to you, but none of you can show any reason whatsoever that you should get a dime. I don't think you understand the concept of loving someone and letting them gift your money, and what's worse, I don't trust a single one of you. The only one here that gives anything of a rat's shit about me is my wife. I have only come to this stupid gathering for the last few years because she has asked me to. She keeps telling me family is important because she knows the void of not having any. But you know what? Starting right now, I will learn about it because I am done you can all screw right off. Let's go D. I turned and walked, grabbing my keys and wallet from the kitchen bench and Diana and my phones. I was halfway out the door, Diana meekly following me before dad tried to respond. Now listen up here boy. I whirled back and glared at him, my mother sitting beside him still shocked withered at the force of my expression. No dad, now you listen here. My name is Harry. It's not boy. It's not mistake. It's not any other belittling name that you can all think of, it's Harry, and in case you need to spell it as you have never said it, that's spelt H-A-R-R-Y, but you know what call me whatever you want from now on because I am done with you and all of this family goodbye. Without another word leaving everyone in shock, I walked out and jumped into the Camaro. Diana got in silently beside me. I tore out of the driveway, leaving tire marks and a lot of smoke burning rubber as I tore away. I glanced back and saw them standing out the front, watching me go. It didn't take long before the call started, first dad's phone, which I ignored, then mom's phone, even Greg and Joan had to go when that didn't work, they started texting me and then even when that didn't work, they tried Diana. She wisely ignored everything. We had been on the road for almost an hour on the way home when Diana broke the silence. Harry, are you okay? No, no, I'm not D. I've held all that in for almost as long as I can remember, and it keeps getting worse as time goes by. I am sorry. But after those comments from Greg today, I couldn't stand it anymore. I want nothing more to do with them. A tear came to my eye. I didn't like my family. I am not sure if I even loved my family anymore. But, when I looked at Diana, I felt love, my family. Well, that feeling had faded years ago. I was now beginning to realize. For a long time, I had tolerated them, but that's about it. On reflection, it must have been a two-way street of just tolerating as from what I could recall of their treatment of me. But for the life of me, I could not understand why a family would treat someone the way they did. I started crying, mourning for the loss of something I never really understood that I had lost as I drove home. Diana put an arm on my leg. It is okay, my love. I understand. I am quite proud of you. Look, let's give it a few weeks, and I will step in the void for you. I really don't want to talk to them without you. But in this case, I will be your champion and make sure they understand that we are done with them. Are you okay? She shook her head. No, Harry. Like you I'm not okay. That stuff that I told you I know. I think we will have to speak about it soon. If we are truly cutting your family out of our lives, we need to talk about it. I need to tell you some things, but I'm scared, and as I told you, what I know is it's not pretty, 
and I don't know everything. But you need to know that I love you so so much, and my love, my life, my very soul is yours. So, I will fight for you. I will stand for my man this time. She was trembling as she said that. I was angry and pissed off, but she was scared, and I felt myself rise above my feelings. We can talk about it now. You're trembling. We can find somewhere to stop. No, Harry. I need a little time to sort this out. There are things that I need to get hold of. Could you trust me for a couple of weeks? D. I don't know. I'm worried. I don't like the fear and sadness behind you right now. She teared up. I know, baby. But if we do this, we do this right, and I need to get some things in order before we talk, okay? I don't like it, D. But yes, I will trust you. I get the feeling that this will all change our lives more than I want to admit. However, please don't take long. If anything, this afternoon showed me that I am struggling here in the dark with something I know nothing about, and it scares the shit out of me. We spent most of the drive home reassuring each other that it was going to be okay. But, in the back of my mind, storm clouds were gathering. I could feel that Diana would rock my world with revelations that I would not be pleasant, and she needed time to get ready for it. Damn, this was not going to be fun. We grabbed some leftovers from the fridge and ate a small meal before getting ready for bed. I would spend the afternoon in the office getting ready for some presentations in the coming weeks, but the morning would be Diana and I were having breakfast with Jack and Cindy. As we got into bed and kissed, Dee grabbed me and giggled. Baby, did you mean what you said to Greg about comparing sizes? I laughed for the first time in hours. Yes, being brothers, we did see each other naked a few times growing up. I'll be honest. I don't know about hard I made that up. However, from what I do recall, Greg is a lot smaller than me, soft. I was just so mad that I perhaps went a little overboard. Baby, you know, while you may not believe that you have all his muscles, based on what you said, I think you have the two muscles that are much larger than him where it counts. Two. She giggled again. Yes, two. The one down here, she said. And the one up here, she said, leaning in and kissing me between the eyes. You are the smartest man I know. You're rich yet humble. You have almost a thousand employees worldwide, and even Norman would be lost without you. And not once until today have I seen you lose it at anyone, and today you use logic. You only threw at them what you thought of as truth and nothing more. As I said in the car, I was so proud of you. I love you. My wife suddenly looked at me in a sultry manner. Now, Mr. Other, do you think you have it in you to fill me up and make a baby with me as you mentioned at your parents today? My reply was nothing but doing what she wanted, and over the next hour, I filled her twice. The next few weeks were a little edgy. Work was busy as we prepared a new variation on my already famous plastics formula, nothing that would require a new or update to the patent, but an ability to yield more product without a drastic increase in the base materials, basically a more significant profit for us. Diana and I really got into baby making, and she spent time reading on the correct positions and frequency, clothing options, time of day, and everything else you do when you are trying for a baby. She was coming up to her most fertile time so we would be having sex every two days to try and conceive. I was getting to come inside my wonderful wife every morning, and every night who was I to complain. My family was still trying to smooth bridges, apparently. My storm out caused a massive yelling match between the four of them left behind. I have no idea why they were yelling at each other. Sure, I was giving them some truths about them and their behavior towards me, but I was the one they were raving about, and I was no longer there. When my mother could not get hold of Diana or me, she tried calling Norman and Jack. Both were unaware of the issue with my family, and when I gave them the abridged version, they were sympathetic. After listening one afternoon, Jack was trying to be the peacemaker. Harry, you know at some point, you're going to have to talk to them again. Why not sooner rather than later? You have said what you wanted, and as someone who saw the bruises on your body more than once growing up, I looked at him, and he held up his hand. Yes, a few of us teachers saw them. So did a few students. We put two and two together and figured it was either your father or Greg. It was one of the reasons many of us pushed to get you the scholarship. We knew we needed to get you out of that house before something happened that we would have had to take notice of regardless of you defending them. But you did, and you have grown so much. You have an amazing wife, a damn good company, and you will be a great father. However, and I hate that I am the one saying this, you also need your family if you can get them on your terms, and I do stress now that you have had your say to them, your terms. I didn't want to admit it, however, he was right and also right that it needed to be on my terms. However, I also didn't know that my terms were about to be ignored. The following night at home, Diana and I had just finished screwing each other's brains out, and we were relaxing on the bed when she brought up the topic of my family. Baby, I think I need to go and see your parents tomorrow. What? 
I almost spat at her. I was trying to come to terms with what Jack had said yesterday, but it was still hard going. She sighed. Cindy called me today and told me about your chat with Jack. Not all the details, but Jack is worried about you. And there is something that I need from them before I can talk to you and clear the air. Besides, if I go there and just talk to your mother without your dad or Greg, it is likely that there will not be any screaming. I was uneasy about this and something wasn't right. However, I needed to trust her. Okay. You call me the moment you arrive and the moment you leave. Around two the next afternoon, Diana headed off in her Jeep. She texted me just after she arrived and before she went in. For the next two hours, I was worried. I started trying to call her after 7.30. By 8.30, I was getting frantic. I called my mother. The call went to voicemail. Mom, where is Diana? About five minutes later, I got a text back. She's not here. I got in my car and started driving. I also started calling everyone. I figured that I would drive the route between our house and my parents' house. Then, if something had happened, I would know. I prayed that nothing had happened to my wife. Calling our friends one at a time, they had heard nothing, but everyone would keep watch and let me know the moment they heard something. Cindy was worried and tried to console me. I let her know I was driving towards my parents, the most likely route my wife would take to see if I could find her. I made it all the way to my parents, and Diana's car was parked in the driveway. What the hell, mom? A text saying she's not here. A sense of dread started to build in my stomach as I got out of the car. It was almost 10 at night. Everyone would have heard my Camaro pull up. My mother met me at the door in her house robe and a panicked expression on her face as I started walking up to the house. Harry, she tried to stop me. Harry, Harry, don't go in there. I pushed my way in the door past my mother, her pleas falling of uncaring ears. Nothing was immediately amiss, but then I heard the noise. It came from my parents' bedroom. I charged through the doorway, and my world ended. Right there, naked and strapped to the bed on her stomach, hips raised by a pillow, and her hips presented for use was my wife. She was being screwed by my prick of a father. He was pushing his in and out of her, oblivious to the intrusion. My brother was watching and grinning, standing beside the bed and looking like he was just getting his steam back. It seemed that he had just done Diana. My bitch of a sister was also there, naked, sitting on the side of the bed. I screamed. What the hell is going on here? Just what it looks like, boy. We are using your wife how she likes it. He was grinning now. My brother looked at me and laughed, obviously getting off on the pain they were causing me. She's always been our mistake. But look at how she loves it. Her body loves us in ways you never could. I couldn't see blackness was starting to close in. The storm clouds that kept circling my life breaking a raging storm for my very being. This couldn't be happening. This couldn't be happening. My wife, the woman who rescued me from these people and professed her undying love for me, the recipient of my love, the owner of my very soul, a soul that right now was being destroyed in front of me by my very family. Trust me, she said. Trust me and like a fool I did. I stumbled backwards out of my parents' bedroom doorway, falling to the ground in the hallway, and my mother touched my shoulder. I wasn't thinking. I pushed her back hard. She fell and looked at me for a minute, stunned. But I couldn't see. I was in pain. It felt like my heart was about to burst. My chest. I heard my sister laugh. I guess we can add the stupid cuck to his list of names now. The tears started. I got up, not sure what to do. My arms felt like lead. I could feel my pulse in my neck beating like a freight train. Back in the bedroom. I could hear my father groaning. He was climaxing in my wife. I stumbled further back down the hallway grabbing the entry table by the front door. No. I moaned. I heard them chuckle in the room. My mother was recovering from the push I gave her. She looked at me. Harry, it will. That was the last I heard as I bolted out the door. I couldn't take the betrayal of Diana and my family anymore. I ran for my car. I have no idea how I got it started. However, I was out of there. I was driving like a bat out of hell, crying, and I had no idea if I would be alive in the next hour, but I didn't care. As far as I was concerned, my life was now over. Every reason for my life was undone, betrayed by the very person that had promised to bear my children. When the siren and lights started to chase me, I was driving on automatic, doing at least 60 over the speed limit. I didn't care. I sped on. I turned the corners, my tears gone, my rage now welling up inside me. I shifted to sports mode in my overpowered Camaro and made the police work for it. It didn't matter that they would already know the car. It didn't matter that my license plates would have traced them to my house. I drove, screw them, they hadn't just been betrayed by everyone they cared about. Let them bring the whole force and catch me. 
If I was going down, I'd make it a spectacular end to John Other. Then the thought caught me. But what about my cheating wife? What about my betraying family? If I die, then they would get everything. They would win. I was still leading the police on a chase. I was losing them, but surely, they would have a chopper coming in, and there would be more cars ahead. Think. I speed dialed Jack. Hey Harry, how's it going? How did D? Did you find her? I had the chase back the tears. No time to talk, I am in trouble, and I need you to come to bail me out at the police station immediately. Call Norman and make sure my lawyer is updated, and there as well. Jack, if you are my friend and I think you and Norman may be my only friends in the world right now, then please do this now as I don't know if I can hold it together much longer. Shit, Harry what's going on? Not now, I need to go, call Norman now and come get me. Now for the tricky bit. I drove myself to the local police station a few kilometers from my house and turned myself in. I beat four squad cars there that were chasing me by around four minutes and was already explaining myself to the officer on the front desk when they all came running in. Harry, what the hell is going on mate? It was Tim Redwick. He was an officer in the local and was a year ahead of me in school. We'd gotten to know each other a little over the years. He and I both loved Camaros, so he knew mine. He was a good guy. I thought someone had stolen your car. He took one look at me and knew something was wrong. Is Diana okay? With the mention of Diana, I just fell to the floor and started sobbing. My nose started to run, and my chest heaved. Sure I had been upset at my parents, but the adrenaline in my system had just run out. I suppose they figured out I was no danger. My keys were with the front desk, and I was at the station. I was incoherent, and to be honest, I had no idea what was going on around me for a while. Finally, someone helped me up from the reception floor, and I was moved. I felt a seat, a couch, and I sat down. I was brought tissues and water, but I sat there in anguish. I don't know how long I was there before I started to come back to myself, but I overheard voices. I've checked all incidents around the area, and there is no report of someone being involved with Diana's description that sounded like Tim. Harry told me that Diana was going to his parents' place yesterday evening. She was after some information that was important to them. Harry called me looking for her around 9.30, then he called me close to midnight asking me to get Norman and Paul here because he was in trouble. What trouble is he in, Tim? That sounded like Jack. I don't know, Jack. Earlier Harry took several squad cars, including me on a merry chase. He's clearly in major distress right now, but also no one got hurt, and he came right here. So something is very, very wrong. Has he spoken about Diana at all? That was Norman. I instantly felt arms around me. Cindy was there. Shush, Harry. It's okay. We are here. What's happening, where Diana? I fell apart sobbing again, mumbling to myself. Cindy managed to pick out the works, D, betrayed, parents, before I fell to what felt like madness again. I think I fell asleep then. I woke with a start. I was lying on a couch with a blanket over me, a pillow under my head. I had been dreaming. Diana was moaning and being double teamed by father and brother. My sister looked at me smiling. My mother's voice came out of my wife's mouth, you're just a skate. Don't worry boy, this will fix it all. I almost screamed, but I managed to keep it together. I was in some sort of a lounge. On the other side was Norman, June sitting at a table. Tim was there too. However, Jack and Cindy, who I was sure were here earlier, were nowhere to be seen. My sudden movement caught their attention, and June was instantly by my side, her soothing voice quietly settling me down. It's okay Harry, you're okay. You're still at the police station, it is mid-morning, and it's going to be okay. She was stroking my back. As I sat up, she moved to sit with me. She kept saying it was going to be okay. I had always wondered what maternal love would feel like. Now, June was acting more like a mother than mine ever had. Where's Jack and Cindy? I thought that they were here earlier. Tim, Norman and June looked at each other. I don't know if you're ready to hear it, Harry, Norman spoke. I swallowed. I could feel my pulse start to race and my chest tighten. Diana? They nodded. I guess I need to hear it at some point. I steeled myself. They are at the hospital with Diana. Okay, the hospital, wait, hospital? I may have been in pain. I may have felt like everything had fallen apart, that everyone had betrayed me, but I still loved her. Was she hurt? Did they end up doing a sex act that somehow had hurt her? Norman spoke again. Harry, we have spent the last few hours talking, and I think W have some idea of what happened to you last night. I know that if I were in your shoes, I would feel that what I went through was one of the worst betrayals ever. You feel that almost everyone betrayed you. We believe that what you must have seen pretty much shut your mind and body down. We managed to get three words out of you, and in short order, we had some ideas, 
So Tim here got a car over to your parents' place to try to find things out. Tim took over. Harry, there was trouble, and it isn't over yet. Two officers knocked on your parents' door around 2 a.m. There were lights on, so they knew people were home. It took around 15 minutes of knocking before your mother came to the door. They didn't have probable cause allowing them to enter the house without a warrant, but the report from you was enough for them to question the occupants of the house. It took another 20 minutes of talking to your mother before your father came out and tried to send them away. His position was that there was nothing wrong. It was the only family in the house, and there had been no disturbances other than you coming to their place earlier and having an argument with your wife. He told the officers that he threw you out for disrespecting family and that your wife was staying to be looked after them due to your temper. He paused to look at me a moment. How you holding up so far? He asked. I ground my teeth. That is not what happened. But I sense it's not the end of the story. I'll keep it together for now. Tim nodded. Norman and June were also listening. They had not yet heard the report as I was not awake. They just knew that Diana was in the hospital being looked after. The result was that the officers had nothing else to go on and no further reason to stay. So they were leaving, however, as your mother closed the door. Your brother came out of the master bedroom naked and mouthing off. Dad, hurry up. She's waking up, and we need to drug her again before we can screw her. What? Norman, June and I screamed at Tim almost at the same time. We were all on our feet in an instant. Harry, Diana was drugged and assaulted. I could again feel my world closing in. My chest tightened. I started to hyperventilate. This time my anguish was for Diana. I was there. I was there. She had been strapped down and wasn't moving, but I never really noticed. OMG, what have I done? I left her there. I felt I was going into shock again. I was in the room, and I thought. I had thought? I began to fall back down, but June held me up. Harry, she whispered in my ear, Harry, don't fall. Diana needs you right now. She was right. I had betrayed her worse than I felt she had betrayed me. I needed to hear the rest. My resolve locked into place. I think they sensed it. Tim, can you keep going? I need to hear this. He nodded. It's okay, Harry. This is hard for everyone. He took a deep breath. Apparently, it took a moment of Greg and your parents with a deer in the headlights look before they tried to react. First, your father tried to push the door closed. However, the lead officer pushed the door in and burst into your parents' bedroom, where Greg had appeared from. Next, your brother took off and ran into the back of the house. The officer would have pursued him. However, he had found Diana. His partner was calling for backup and drawing his weapon as the situation was escalating quickly. They found Diana strapped to the bed, crying and screaming for you. Your sister was beside her naked and lying back, eyes closed, getting off on the fact that Diana was helpless and couldn't do anything. In short order, there were an additional four officers on the scene, and within minutes, all of them were in the house, and more backup was on the way. Your sister was arrested there on the floor beside the bed, your mother in the front doorway. However, Greg and your father got away. Apparently, they both ran to the back of the house and teamed up on one of the officers searching for them. Then they did the same to a second. Both officers are in the hospital, and your father and brother are on the run. As for Diana, she was untied, and the officers covered her with a blanket until the ambulance arrived. Harry, she has some understanding that you were there last night. She's in a mess worse than you. She's sedated but keeps asking for you. Even asleep, she keeps saying that she needs to protect you. Well, I need to go then. I need to go to her. I need you to hang on a few minutes, Harry. Due to everything that is happening, you are not under arrest. However, I need a statement from you. And there is some processing to be done. Diana's in the hospital, and she's safe right now. When can we get him to his wife? June asked. Soon, Harry. Can I take your statement? The sooner we do this, the better. So, for the next hour, I told Tim, along with Norman and June, who had been permitted to stay. What had happened? How Diana had gone to talk to my parents following my blow-up at them. I explained how there were some things that she needed to have a serious talk with me about my family. I expanded further, letting them know how I had been freaking out. I headed to my parents after I got the text message that she wasn't there. How I found everyone in my family practically naked and my mother in a robe and had barged in to see my father screwing Diana, who was tied to the bed. I related to them how at the time. I had thought that Diana was a willing participant and how I fell out and ran. How I was fleeing in pain, driving away, and just wanting everything to end. I told my audience how I came back to my senses once I started getting chased by the police and went straight here to hand myself in, calling Jack to get Norman and a lawyer. I explained how I collapsed and knew almost nothing other than a few flashes once time arrived, 
and I fell to the ground waking up here a little while ago. Tim was making some notes, and he asked about the names and cut comments. Something was going through his brain. Finally, I explained, my father has never called me by my name. Greg has always called me the mistake. So I suppose they thought the cut comment was belittling me further. Harry, this is a sensitive one. When we were at school, you would often come to school in clothes too big, and there was a rumor that you were always walking funny and had bruising. When medical staff did the initial inspection of Diana, they found that not only had she been restrained, but she also had bruising on her back, consistent with being beaten. Would this be related? I could feel the fuse to my anger was lit. My family had beaten my wife as I had been, drugged and assaulted. The woman I would walk barefoot over broken glass for was beaten because of me. Shit. I needed to be strong. I explained how I was beaten by Greg when he felt like it growing up, how the system worked where I was barely tolerated. I told them how my achievements were belittled. It took perhaps another 10 minutes till Tim was satisfied, and he asked us to wait so he could file his report. It took perhaps another 20 minutes before Tim was back. Okay guys, there are a few things here. First of all, the charges around speeding and evading police arrest have been dropped in favor of you undertaking a defensive driving test. To further smooth things over, I took the liberty to talk to the station commander and put you in for generous sponsorship of a few of our upcoming police charity events. This was by far the biggest issue for you legally, so you are now free. Before I could move, he continued, I am arranging a car to take you to the hospital. I don't think you are in any condition to drive. Looking at Norman and June, we can also take both of you if you like. However, there is one other issue. We looked at Tim. Your mother and sister are being held here. He let that sink in. Your mother, she's asking for you. This one was easy. I don't care. I need to get to Diana. Tim nodded, and we got the rest sorted out. Tim ended up taking me directly to the hospital in his police cruiser while Norman and June took my car home, letting me know they would grab some clothes for both Diana and me. They would then drive up to the hospital and meet us. When we arrived, I was taken directly to the private suite that Diana had been given. After coming out of emergency and confirming her status and insurance, she was being given the top-tier treatment. She was hooked up to a number of machines and was resting fitfully. When I entered the room, I went directly to her bed and kissed her forehead and held her hand. I don't know if she knew if I was there or not, but she settled down right away. Jack and Cindy came in not moments later, and without releasing my grip on Diana's hand, we hugged and again cried. The next few days were an emotional roller coaster. People were coming and going. Norman, June, Jack, Cindy, Tim, some of the team at work that knew both Diana and I. Word had gotten around that Diana and I were in some serious shit, and a lot of the city was getting behind us. We got cards and flowers from so many different people. Most I had no idea who they were. That first night I slept in the chair beside Diana. I think it was about 2 a.m. when I felt a hand on my head, and I looked up to see her awake and just staring at me. My hand had not left hers since I arrived. I am so so sorry, was the first thing out of my mouth. Please tell me you love me. Her eyes desperately looking into mine. I love you so much, to think that. Shush. She used a weak hand to guide me in, and I kissed her, sweet and gentle. Then, I crawled on the bed and trying not to disturb any of the equipment attached to her. I wrapped my arms around my wife, my beautiful wife that had been through so much. Then we cried together until we both fell asleep. The following day, the hospital staff bought a unique double hospital bed in. I could stay with Diana. She had an four drip and was on some painkillers and other drugs. So, she, and by an exemption, we would be in the hospital for a few days. Lather in the afternoon, Tim and a female officer came by. With them was Norman, June, Jack, Cindy and Paul, my lawyer. Tim and the female officer, Karen was her name, needed a statement. So, Diana asked Paul as our lawyer and me to stay as she talked. It was almost as horrific as what I had imagined. Diana had gone around to my parents to talk to my mother about my fight with them. She had wanted to be an olive branch between them and me. However, she also wanted a few of my documents including my original birth certificate and a couple of other legal documents. She was there around 20 minutes, sitting with my mother on the couch we always sat on at their place when Joan brought them all a cup of tea. She recalled the tea tasting a little strong but didn't think anything of it until she woke up, naked and strapped face down on the bed a few hours later. Oh, look, the mistake's little wifey is awake now, laughed Greg grabbing her hair and spitting in her face. Mr. High and Mighty Mistake thinks this one is so amazing, so pure that there is nothing she can do wrong. Well, guess what? We're gonna make you ours, and the mistake is gonna raise kids that aren't his, Greg laughed hysterically. Enough, Greg, 
said my dad walking in the room with both Joan and my mother. The boy's little princess didn't play ball with us the last few years, after everything we did for her. She thinks we forgot, and that she's untouchable. Well, now she's going to learn how this family really works. He looked at my sister. Joan, go and get everything. Martha, make sure that we are not disturbed. Greg welcomed the boy's wife, just like you would welcome him home. With that, Greg got a sadistic grin on his face and began to drool and lean over, raising one fist above his head and struck Diana on the left side of the back. Diana screamed, Welcome to the family, bitch. With that, Joan re-entered the room carrying some vials and needles. She had a big smile on her face. Again, my dad instructed and directed. Now everyone gets ready. It's time to take care of the guest of honor. Everyone started undressing. Now, just to explain everything to you, my dear, my father leaned into Diana. I know you are not going to join us willingly, so we're going to give you a little hand. My beautiful Joan has with her is a strong sedative. They use this for a few different things, including brain surgery, where the patient needs to be awake but unable to feel. With this drug variant, if we have it right, you will be semi-aware and feel everything, but you won't respond or move. At this point, Diana began to struggle against the bonds. Greg! Another fist slammed into her back. Diana cried out then stayed still. That's better. Now what's going to happen is you're going to join this family function. Greg and I are going to screw you. We're going to do this every two weeks until you're pregnant, and you're going to give the boy his treatment so that when you're pregnant, you will make it look like it's his. He laughed. Diana tried to scream. Greg raised a fist, and Diana flinched. The pain in her back was already aching. Now Diana, see I can use your name, see how I can be reasonable. I just stopped Greg from striking you again. If you play ball with us, we will look after you. Now you're going to let the boy raise our kids, just like they're his for a few years, and you are going to play nice. If you say anything, I will let him know we're doing you, and let me know our history. Joan then reached over and stuck a needle in Diana's arm. Done. She will just a few minutes, Dad. Joan positioned her naked body in front of Diana. She was disgusted seeing her husband's younger sister naked and enjoying this torture. Excellent now, Diana. As I was saying, you're going not to say a thing to the boy, or it's all going to come down on you. He will kick you out, and you will be homeless. So tonight, we are all going to have our turns with you. And tomorrow you're going to go home and let him know you talk late into the night, and it was easier to stay here. He didn't know at the time that I had been trying to call Diana, and my mother had responded with a text saying Diana wasn't there. Diana, know this, just as he is not my son. We're going to make sure that you will never have his, he hissed. From there, everything got very blurry, whatever the drugs were kicking in. She recalled sobbing in her last moments of awareness, desperately wanting to wake up from the nightmare. She believed they had taken her several times. At one point, she thought she heard Harry's voice and tried to wake up enough to scream, but she couldn't. The next thing she recalled was a blanket being put over her as she came back to some sense of reality, then coming in and out of dreams and waking up with Harry here beside her. By this point, she was crying almost uncontrollably. Diana, my wife, had been beaten, abused, assaulted, taken against her will, drugged and tortured by people that were supposed to be my family. I wasn't upset anymore. I was angry. No, as I listened to her tell the story, I was beyond angry. I was going to destroy them. My father, my mother, my sister and yes, even my neglecting mother. They would have to crawl down into the darkest pit of hell to find any let up from the wrath that was coming their way. How could any sane person do what they did? For the umpteenth time in my life, I wondered what I had done to them to have them treat me like this. After taking Diana's statement, Tim and Karen bid us farewell and would come and check on us later. Everyone else was about to come back into the room when a thought struck me. I asked everyone to give Diana and me some more time. They were a little perplexed, but sensing that this was something serious, they closed the door and let us be. They knew a little of what had happened, but I doubted that our friends knew the whole story. As they closed the door, Diana looked a little worried, and I will admit that I was also a little concerned. My wife had been abused before we met and had also just been used by my own family. I wasn't sure what problems we were facing between us, physically, sexually, psychological. But I knew that she had not gone out to betray me. It might hurt, but I would need to be there for her. Right now, she was still processing. I knew at the very least we were going to need a damn good psychologist for both of us. But at this point, I was pretty sure that Diana was in a lot more pain than I was. I leant back on the bed and wrapped my arms around her and just held her for a few minutes. No words were exchanged and Diana had broken down again, sobbing. Her hand had again tightened like a vice on my arm. 
I knew that this would be something that would happen a lot for the next little while. I was sad. We had an incredible relationship, but it had been tarnished. Damn them. Why did that have to do something so cruel to me? One of their own blood. That thought brought back the anger, and I seethed for a moment. But the thought of blood brought the idea from before back to mind, which Diana had just mentioned to me. As Diana settled down again, I knew I had to ask some tough questions. D, I am not going to ask if you're okay. I know you're not. I'm not. And I want you to know that I am still totally and absolutely in love with you, even after everything. So, I can tell you we're going to get through this, and I would like to get through it together, okay? She turned and looked at me. She had taken off her glasses, and her beautiful brown eyes were ringed red. Her face was blotchy. He knows was running. She was a woman in distress, but as she looked at me, I think she knew I wasn't going to run. She was searching for hope, and she needed an anchor. I so desperately wanted to be that, but I had to know more. A few minutes ago, as you were telling us the story, you mentioned something, something that I had never heard anyone say before. Do you mind if I ask you about it? If you don't want to talk about it, let me know, and I'll leave it be, okay? She nodded. You mentioned the statement, he's not my son? Diana, what did he mean? He's not my son? For a moment, she worried, then looked at her hands, then she looked at me. She was struggling to talk and kept looking for me through her hands, but she told me. My love, this is one of the things I have wanted to tell you. It was why I was after the documents from your mother. One of those documents is an old DNA test that they had on you. Roger is not your biological father. So many things just fell into place. So all these years, they all knew and kept it from me. Why? From what I understand, they didn't know until you were around three years old. Then you started growing up it came to light that your mother had an affair. You weren't built like your father and brother. Your hair was the wrong color, these sorts of things. Honestly, I don't know all the details, but that is where all the anger against you comes from. They view you are not part of the family, you're an outsider to them, they had to put up with you, and I believe that Roger would only provide what he had too and not one bit more. And you might suspect the affair is why your mother never stood up for you. You were her shame, the mistake that Roger thought should never have happened. Greg and Joan are his, but you were not. You knew? She hung her head and nodded. Yes, I found out a few months after we started dating, it was accidental as I was viewed pretty much just one of the family friends at that point. Your family didn't know we were dating, and I was loath to tell them, as you were fast becoming the most important thing to me. I had left my prescription sunglasses at their house. I kind of walked in on Roger, sorry I can't call him your dad anymore, having a go at your mom over something you had done, I think it was over your chemistry patent. He mentioned that since you were not his son, he shouldn't have to put up with your attitude and that you owed him for raising you or something along those lines. They knew I had heard the last bit, so Roger walked out of the room and Martha confided in me a few things. She paused for a moment, took a breath and continued. There is more, Martha confided in me and showed me the DNA evidence, and she also hinted that she had a letter from your real father to you, but Roger would never allow you to see it. These are what I wanted to get for you. They are the reason I went to their place the other afternoon. I had hoped that I could get Martha to give me the documents without Roger being there, as they should be in your possession. I wanted to tell you so badly, but I couldn't tell you the story because it wasn't mine to tell. I knew Roger would never tell you. However, I was trying to get your mother to stand up for you at least once to tell you the truth. I sighed. My life was feeling more and more like a mess. I suppose it had been forever. I just never knew. I needed to move forward, though, and I thought of my next question. This one could hurt my already fragile wife. Why couldn't you tell me? Diana looked down at her hands and didn't say anything for a long time. D, why didn't you tell me? I need to know. There is a pain inside me right now, and I need the pieces of the puzzle to help put me, put us back together. Her nod was almost unperceivable. This is a hard one, Harry. Do you recall right before our first time? I freaked out, calling myself damaged. I was not the pure woman I was supposed to be, not the virgin that I thought you deserved. I laid my hand on her arm. Of course, I didn't care. I wanted you to be mine, and you gave yourself wholly to me. Tears dripped down her face onto the hospital bed, but she continued. What I could never tell you was that I had an uncle that was still alive before I met you. I didn't know it until I was almost out of high school, but he was a blood relative. The child protection agency thought it would be good to get me to live with a family member, have some stable roots, and all that jazz. Well, good old Uncle Clinton was not the family type. Oh, he took the money all right but he didn't want a child. He drank a lot and even did some fairly hard drugs. One night he came into my room and, she paused, sobbing. He hand holding mine like her life was about to expire. 
He came into my room and took me against my will. He took my virginity and ruined me. She cried, and I held her. I had never even suspected the loving, caring, dedicated sexual vixen that would screw me three ways from Sunday had such a horrible childhood. About three months later, he died. Overdosed on a bad batch of whatever he was taking. I hadn't been living there very long, but it was one of the worst times of my life. But I was now 18, and he left me nothing in his will, so I was back on my own will, only a little money and a just few clothes to my name. I managed to arrange a part-time admin job with a company while I enrolled and started college. It wasn't a lot of money, but it paid a few bills while I waited for the government study allowance. I found a cheap apartment with a couple of girls, which is where I met Cindy. But my issue was the company where I found work. It was a construction company, and you can guess which one. Yep, one guess MJG Constructions, my former father's company. I had been there about six months. Roger always liked to invite people from the office to spend time at his gatherings. I think he thought it built culture, or showed he was an awesome boss, something like that. I nodded. We had always been told to be on our best behavior when the rolling crew of friends attended the regular gatherings. Well, after six months there was a day where Roger came into the office and spent a whole lot of time talking to everyone but me. I was doing a lot of the admin, assisting in scheduling workers on jobs, getting the trucks rostered, that kind of thing. But after Roger did the rounds, he came and sat down on the side of the desk. He told me that he would like me to come to the next gathering, that he had a son that he would like me to get to know. He explained that you didn't fit in with the family, but as I was nerdy looking, his words, that you might like me. I was a bit taken back by the nerdy looking comment, but he went on to tell me he knew about my uncle's situation and that he could keep me employed and keep my history with my uncle under wraps with the company if I would come and get to know you. I shook my head, putting more pieces of the puzzle together. So, my father, sorry, I mean Roger, my ex-father, non-father. Something like that set us up? Yes, what I didn't learn till later after I announced you as my boyfriend. She smiled at that. The first happy memory all day, and I felt the sun peek from under the clouds. What I learned was that he introduced us because he wanted a way to get at your money. He knew from your relationship that he could never ask you for money. There was too much risk you would rebuff him. That point stained even the relationship with your mother. So he planned to use me as a lever to get things out of you. However, I quit working there once my college money came through. That happened not long after we met, and he didn't get to use me that way. So, how did you know about it then? She took a deep breath. He told me, it was after I announced us dating. He told me that if I didn't do things his way that he would tell you that my uncle had, done things to me. He told me that he would make sure that you would never touch me since I was damaged goods. How did you respond? It was really hard. I was falling for you hard, so I didn't want to lose you. Also, him calling me damaged goods hit me hard. Still. I also knew you enough to know you would make your own choices, so I told him that I would be the mediator if you and the family needed to talk about things, but in no way would I ask you for money, that was yours, he could threaten me, expose me, but I would not betray you in that way. Suddenly it was like a weight that I had run around with for years that I never knew was lifted off me. Diana, before you say anything else, I need to say something to you. She looked at me, and I could see anxiety building. She had just told me something that could end our relationship if I wanted, and was ready to burst again and I felt her hands go even tighter on my arm. I patted her arm in return. You are the most incredible, amazing woman I have ever met. I loved you so much before I knew this history. I loved you as the center of my universe, and I did not think I could love you more. When I saw you on that bed in my parents' room, it was as if everything inside me was torn out, that my heart and soul were removed, and I was just an empty husk. Apparently, once I got to the police station, I was almost catatonic. My world had collapsed so badly. I had loved you so completely that I was lost to everything. She was about to break. Again the tears flowed. She looked down to her lap. You say loved. Has what they did to me changed your love for me? Nothing can change my love for you. She looked up at me. No, if anything, my love for you has become stronger than before, Diana. My love. You have been used, betrayed. You have fought for me and never once have you done anything that would dishonor me. You went to that house to get something you thought I should have. Yes, you didn't tell me everything, but in the light I day, I cannot fault your logic and even amid this shitstorm we are in, you're still fighting for me, for us. Diana Other, I could not love you more than I could right now. And I can tell you that there is going to be some wrath poured out on those that have hurt you. You can bet. I paused and got hold of myself. Baby, I know this is going to be hard, we're going to struggle a lot. But if you have me, I will be there every step along the way. With that said, I leaned in, grabbing her jaw and kissed her, 
deep and long, letting all my feelings of love flow into her. It lasted for a long time before there was a knock at the door. Jack put his head in. Hi, is everything okay? No, it's not Jack. We are not okay. However, we have each other, and we will get out of this. I responded. But yes, bring everyone in. If Diana is okay with it, I think there are some things that I think you all need to know. Everyone came into the room, and with Diana's permission, I gave a summary of the last week and some of the family secrets that had been kept back from me. As I told them about my former family assaulting Diana, Jack and Norman got into a serious, pissed-off mood. Then, when I told them about the fact that I was not Roger's son, that my mother had an affair or something like that, they were astounded. Then, when I told them about the plan to use Diana to get her pregnant and extort money from me, they were embarrassed for me. I laughed. Well, it backfired. I got the best of them with that. I got an amazing woman that we are going to stay together, and now all that money is going to go into making them all pay. We spent the rest of the afternoon talking. After a while, Diana withdrew into herself as some of the revelations about her past came out. Tim knocked on the door and came in. Everyone else sensed it was time to head off and left, letting us know they would check in with us first thing tomorrow. Tim gave us the update. They had a couple of leads on Roger and Greg, but that the moment they were still at large. My mother and sister were still locked up and had a visit from their company lawyer. Tim wasn't sure if he would be their lawyer much longer after hearing the charges were on the girls and what they would be for the men when they were caught. The company and family finances had not been frozen. However, that was also only a matter of time. We spent a few more minutes chatting, and he left, letting us know he would keep us informed. I sent a message to my lawyer letting him know I wanted to talk about bailing out MJG. Despite everything, there were a lot of people that relied on that company for income. If the business was viable, I could perhaps purchase it and keep them employed. However, I wasn't sure the lawyers would need to look at it. That night we slept in the big hospital bed together, wrapped in each other's arms. Diana was going to be in for another two days before they would release her. They were doing complete work upon her, and she needed to speak with the hospital counselor before letting her go. Fortunately, Norman and June had brought clothes and comforts from home for both of us, so we were good for creature comforts. In the morning, we showered together in the tight hospital cubicle, and while I think we both wanted to play as we would typically have, we just washed each other and held each other, feeling just a little bit of safety in each other's arms. Later that day, Diana's doctor, a woman by the name of Marge Hill, came in. Dr. Hill ran through most of the blood work, noting that Diana was in good health and could be released tomorrow despite everything. However, she wasn't done. There is something else we need to talk about of a sensitive nature. Usually, we do this one-on-one -on -one with the patient. So would it be okay if your husband leaves the room? Diana grabbed my arm. No, it's okay, Dr. Hill. You can say anything in front of my husband. Marge nodded. Okay, I had to check. During your blood screening, we noticed some hormonal indicators in your blood that were a little different than normal. In the trauma that you have been through, some changes are normal, the body goes through a lot of stress, but these indicators are something of more maternal nature, she closed out, seeing if we followed her logic. Are you saying that I am pregnant? Dr. Hill nodded her head in the positive. Yes, you're pregnant. And after what you have been through, it is the reason why we usually talk one-on-one. -on -one. We need to authorize some paternity tests when the time is right. Boom. There it was, it was possible that not only me, but my ex-father or my ex-brother may have knocked up my wife. I didn't know how to feel, and neither did Diana. We were both confused. Dr. Hill jumped in. Look, I know this is hard for both of you, but can I ask if you were sexually active in the lead up to your current situation? I gulped and looked at Diana, and she nodded. Dr. Hill, we have been trying for a baby the last few months, and before this situation, we have been very sexually active almost every day. If that is the case, there is a strong possibility that you are the father. However, as unfortunate as this situation is, I do need to inform you there is a possibility that your father or your brother conceived the baby cold. Ex-father and ex-brother, I growled. She nodded. For what it's worth, I am sorry. However, hiding the truth no matter how hard helps neither of you. Is it possible that you can give us a few minutes? We need to talk. I managed to croak out. Not a problem. Look. I've got several patients to see, and when I come back, I am going to bring prescriptions for what you will need moving forward. Take your time and talk to figure out your next steps. She looked at Diana. Regardless of what you decide to do, know that that man beside you is one of the best I have seen. Not only has he been here with what has happened where most men would run from the hills, but I can see a determination in his eyes that I have yet to find. I just hope that one day I can have that too. It felt like there was a story behind that, perhaps a lost love or something. 
But Diana knew she spoke the truth. I was standing beside her. She had chosen to stand beside me in a wildly messed up situation and had paid a hefty price. Dr. Hill closed the door on her way out, and for the next few minutes, we said nothing and stared at everything except each other. We needed to break the silence and talk. How do you feel, Dee? Honestly, I don't know. I'm pregnant and I didn't know. I know I should feel happy, excited as we've wanted this since our honeymoon, but I am having difficulty being happy. I mean, with everything that has happened. She stopped and swallowed. What if the baby is not yours? I don't know, my love. I mean, in some ways I feel the same. I am so, so angry at them. I feel so helpless and guilty that I didn't protect you. I keep thinking that I failed you. And I am so scared that the baby is not mine. I just wish I could go back in time and stop you from going over there. I know, I don't recall much, but I was scared. The bits I do recall were horrible. I think I threw up once or twice. I remember wanting you to burst in and save me, and I wish I could have been awake to call out to you when you were there. Now this. She gestured down at her belly, which was not yet showing any signs of pregnancy, but she was petite, so it wouldn't take long. What do we do, D? Do we keep it? We had never really talked if we were pro-choice or pro-life, and neither of us was particularly religious. I don't know. I am confused. What if the baby is yours and we don't keep it? I had to agree. Also, what if the baby is not mine? Does this baby deserve not to be loved by two people that were wanting a baby just because of something done by someone outside our ability to control? Diana agreed. Harry, if we kept the baby and found out it was Greg's or even Roger's, she shivered, how would you feel? I wasn't sure how to respond, honestly. I don't know at this moment. Anger is my first reaction. However, we want a baby, and you're pregnant. Do we know how long it could be before we could have another baby, or even if we could have another baby if we did not keep it? Right now, we are struggling because all of this is fresh, we're in pain. I do want to believe that I could get past that to hold our baby in my arms. I don't know that I could pass up the opportunity to love our baby just because they came about in horrendous circumstances. Diana gave me a mournful smile. You know you just said, our baby? I smiled back. I think this is our choice. We still get the paternity test when we can. But this, I said, putting my hand over her tummy, will be our child. We talked about what this could mean. And while I think we were both a little uncomfortable, we wanted to try this. Besides, I was not a wanted child. I was a mistake. Even if this is not mine. I want the opportunity to show the love that I never got. We both agreed. We knew it wasn't going to be easy. But when Dr. Hill returned, we let her know and I could tell she was happy. The following day Diana was discharged, and we headed home. At home for those first few days, Diana was always in the same room as me. She was never far away, and honestly, I didn't mind it that way. I was working from home, and was planning to head back into the lab in a few weeks. When I did, I wasn't sure how Diana would go without me. However, I might see if I could get Cindy or June to come round and help her out. We also have a psychologist come each week to spend time with both of us. We had a lot to deal with separately and together. We tried to be understanding, though we were angrier at the family and ourselves than each other in both our cases. When it was time to head back into the office, I need not have worried. The girls were more than happy to help out, and Diana understood that I couldn't stay away from work forever. The first day was trying. When I got into work, everyone checked in on me, asking over Diana. They didn't know the full details. However, everyone knew that something terrible had happened with my family and that my ex-mother and ex-sister was in jail while the police hunted my ex-father and ex-brother. When I got home, Diana was instantly by my side. She tried not to make it too obvious, but everyone knew. So over the next few weeks, we developed a pattern. Diana would come to work with me a few days a week when I didn't need to be in the lab, and other days Cindy and June would come and spend time with her. About six weeks after the situation, as we were now calling it, Diana and I renewed our wedding commitment with a healthy bout of sex. It wasn't the most earth-shattering lovemaking episode, and at first, we were both a little awkward, but suffice to say, we both came, and we fell asleep content. I was apprehensive that she wouldn't want me after the situation with Roger and Greg, but honestly, she just wanted me to reclaim her for myself. At the same time, she was worried that what I had seen would put me off her. Honestly, I was a little out of it for the first few minutes, but we got through it, and over the next few weeks, we got back into somewhat of a regular pattern. The only thing that really got between us was her growing belly. At what was assumed to be 18 weeks, we went for a scan. Everything was looking good, and we found out that we were having a girl. I was over the moon, and any paternity issues were locked into the back of my mind. Diana was showing now, and I think she was relieved that I was getting excited. We decorated the Nessie beside our bedroom in pinks and purples, 
and got beautiful vinyl decals for the room that our daughter would hopefully love. I also figured that it was time to put one of my family issues to rest, and I contacted Tim to arrange to go and see my mother and sister. I had not seen either of them since that night. A few weeks before, while I was working, Martha and Joan had been charged with a list of offenses as long as my arm. They were due in court in around a month. Until then, they were remanded in custody, as they call it, in jail. Roger and Greg were still at large. Initial reports were that they had been spotted on the other side of the border. However, a more recent report had them closer to home. As a safety precaution, I had 24-hour security guards at the house and work. Both Diana and I had personal panic buttons with GPS signals, and security could respond on average within five minutes around the area. If we planned to go out other than work, we let our security detail know. Until Roger and Greg were caught, we were a little paranoid as they had abused me for years and now assaulted Diana. It was a Saturday afternoon when we ended up in the visitor's room in the local jail. Tim had come with us and had agreed to sit outside the visitor's room with Diana while I sat with my mother first then my sister. Both women had decided to meet with me. The room was similar to what you can imagine from seeing the movies, plain green whales, a metal table and chairs bolted to the floor, though there was no one-way mirror that I could see, though there was a video camera up in one corner. The officer who escorted me and pointed that out and let me know it was video only so they could ensure that no one got hurt. About five minutes later, my mother was bought into the room and she was in a pair of brown coveralls and white shoes. She was handcuffed, and I was asked if I wanted her handcuffed to the bench, for which I declined. Besides the attire, my mother looked like she had aged 20 years in the last couple of months. Her hair was tied back, but not well maintained. Her eyes looked sunken, and her lips sported a couple of tiny scars. Finally, she sat down on the seat opposite me, and the guard went out and closed the door. She just looked at me. I wasn't sure who was going to start, but she beat me to it. How's Diana? I expected questions about me, perhaps the usual apology. Asking about Diana was not the first question I expected from my mother. She's good. She's outside. And she's pregnant. For a moment, her eyes took on a stern look. Then she relaxed. Pregnant. I don't know if I have the right to ask. No, you don't. You have forfeited every maternal right you ever had with what you have either done, condoned, supported or ignored that was done to Diana or me. However, to answer your question at this point, we don't know. We are hoping that it is mine. However, after that night, we know it's possible that it could be Roger or Greg's. She nodded, just looking broken. Harry, I? She trailed off. I filled the gap. I'll be honest. I don't know if I should call you mom or Martha now. I have so much anger in me against all of you. You all hurt the woman I love. So I'll admit I've called you a lot worse over the last few months. There is part of me that wants to call you mom but I just don't think you deserve it. She nodded again. Martha is fine. And anticipating the question you are going to ask next, yes, we are keeping the baby regardless. If the baby is not mine, then I am going to love it with every ounce of my being. Unlike how your prick of a husband treated and raised me, this child will know love. So Diana told you then? Yeah, it came out. How could you, mom? I mean Martha. It appears that everyone knew that I was not Roger's son, except me. How could you keep a secret from me like that for so many years? I knew I was built differently, but I honestly never suspected as I just thought I got my genes from your side of the family. However, that's not the case, is it? She looked away for a few moments and brought her hands to her face to wipe some tears away from her face. I looked at her with no sympathy. I had tissues in my pocket, but she wasn't getting them from me. She looked back at me and appeared to be weighing a few things, then came to some decision. She looked at the wall as she told me where I came from. Back in my late teens, I had a boyfriend, George. He was a slim guy, quite smart. He made me laugh, he kissed me gently, and we even gave each other our virginities. But not long after high school, George and his family moved out of the area. We spoke at a long distance for a while, but we both knew it would never work, so we agreed to break up. Back then, women didn't attend university as much as they do now, so I looked for a job, and I ended up working for a construction firm doing bookkeeping. Now I wasn't the best bookkeeper, but I was good enough. However, while I was working there, I caught the eye of one of the laborers, Roger Other. George and Roger could not have been more different in their approaches to me. Where George was relaxed and gentle, Roger chased after me, and unlike George, Roger chased hard, he was aggressive, and he wouldn't take no for an answer. I ended up dating him for almost six months before he got me into bed, and it wasn't long after that we found out I was pregnant with Greg. Roger's father demanded that I marry him, so we did, and I gave birth to Greg. It was not long after we had Greg that George came back into town. Your father, 
I mean Roger, had just started his business, so he was out all the time. George looked me up, and we reconnected. Martha fell deeper into her memories. It was like high school again. George made me laugh unlike Roger ever could. He brought me gifts and made me feel loved. I suppose it was that feeling, along with Roger being out of two nights combined with a couple of bottles of wine, that got George and me back into bed. Well, suffice to say, I got pregnant again. Oh, I screwed Roger silly when he came home. I felt so guilty about cheating on him, but I never told him that another man had been around until much later. When you were born, Roger was ecstatic. He had two sons, his business was hard work, but he was putting in the hours to make it provide for his family and young sons. He wasn't really home, so I raised both of you as best I could. I pretty much knew that you were not Roger's son, though, and got a DNA test which confirmed it. I never told George, and I let Roger screw me senseless and impregnate me with Joan my guilt was so large. Perhaps about a month after Joan was born, and you were starting a growth spurt that Roger noted that you looked different. He worked on me for weeks, and eventually, he got it out of me that I had slept with someone else, and you were the result. She winced at the memory. Roger beat me pretty hard that night, and I think one of the only things that saved my life was Joan crying and needing to be feed. As it was, I had to sit in a chair outside your room, rocking Joan back and forward to stop him from going in there and killing you outright. After that, he pretty much disappeared for a month. After that, I never heard from him. However, the money kept coming for groceries in the house, so I kept my head down and just looked after the three of you. When he came home, he demanded everything. When it came to you, he just went cold. He wouldn't speak to you. You were three years old at the time, and once when you went up to him, arms outstretched asking for daddy, he reached out to you, and once you were in reach, he just slapped you. I had to run and pick you up as you cried on the ground. I took you to your room, and settled you down. When I came back out, he told me that if I didn't want my child dead, I would keep you away from him. But he said to me that I was never to tell anyone. I don't think he thought the fact of being cucked by his wife was good for his reputation. So, I kept you away from him as much as I could. I think you were around eight when I believe that Roger told Greg, Greg had the same mean streak that had come out in Roger. And I believe that is when you started getting the abuse from Greg. I nodded. That was about right. Roger told me to let you learn to defend yourself and that if I stood tried to stand in the middle, both you and I would be out on the street in an instant as both 304 and son of a 304. So, I let Greg beat you. If he couldn't beat you for some reason, Roger brought me over to him and Greg got to slap me. Usually, later that night, Roger would take me forcefully. Over the years, I had hoped that you would run away or something, but you didn't. Instead, you stayed and took it. I was both proud you could take it, but so sad you didn't react or run away. That's because I had no friends, Roger, Greg and Joan made sure of it. I was stupid enough to defend Greg and hid my bruising because I thought that family looked out for each other. I have learned that's not the case in our family, and that includes my mother. My jab stung, but again she nodded. You're right. She sighed, I will not defend my actions or myself from you. I deserve every part of hate and anger you have for me, but you deserve to know the truth. Now it was my turn to sigh. She continued. When you got the scholarship, I was overjoyed. Finally, finally, you were going to be able to get out from under the family and make your own way. I had hoped that I would be able to see you free. When you started dating Diana, I was doubly happy. She had not only loudly proclaimed you hers, but she also defended you when your father, sorry Roger, tried to put pressure on her. There was a slight smile on her lips. I was actually pretty proud of her that day. Very few people have stood up to Roger over the years. The only time before that when someone got one over on him was when you made your discovery and put in for your pattern. Patent, I interrupted. Right patent. When you filed for your patent and Roger figured out what that meant, he was livid. He beat me pretty bad that night. He also had both Greg and Joan beat me too. It took almost a week before I could leave the house. Even though I was expected to still cook and clean everything. All three of them took to calling me names that time. Are you expecting sympathy? She laughed but it was a dry laugh devoid of humor. No, Harry, I don't expect not do I deserve any sympathy from you. Again, this is just about what happened. Nothing else. I think that was when Roger started planning to try and take your money away from you. I knew that Diana had worked for Roger, and he had some plot in mind with the two of you together. And when all of a sudden you had nice cars, good clothes, you started filling out a little, and there was passion in your eyes, but most of all you were not sharing your money with the family. Roger got the impression that since he allowed you to live, and he believed that you thought he was your father that he was entitled. After all, you were this 304's child that he had been pretty much forced to raise. 
That day when you had your spat as all of us and stormed out, Roger again got angry and started planning. He went off the deep end and was planning to get Greg, Joan and myself to help him kidnap Diana and impregnate her with his children. He figured that if a child were born that was his and not yours, then you would raise it to age, and then he could claim your money as it was his child, not yours. But mom, sorry Martha, that's not how it works. I know, sweetie, but that was what he was thinking. However, they took the opportunity when Diana came up that day to get the DNA report and the letter from your real father that I had stashed away. Joan called Roger and Greg and had them on the way home while she drugged Diana's tea and when she passed out, she slapped me, telling me to know my place, and we waited till the boys got home. I will take to the grave the shame I feel for not getting Diana out of that place. When Roger and Greg got home, then they stepped her down and, and? She was struggling. Beat and assault her, I supplied. Mum nodded. I noticed real tears in her eyes for the first time, and they weren't for herself. Roger ordered all of us to strip, and while each of the boys had their time with Diana while she was out under the effects of the drugs, I was forced to be in the spare room. I threw a robe on and desperately tried to send you away, partially because I knew what you would find, but I was scared they would kill you or, worse, kill Diana. So, I sent the text message when you called, hoping you would think she never came to the house. But I also didn't know the three of them had planned for you to find them with Diana like that. I am so sorry for that. Neither Diana nor you deserved any of it. It is all my fault because I was a cheating bitch. She never looked at me once, but I could see that the brown prison coveralls were now stained a darker color with her tears. I think I can accept that. She continued, I am assuming the rest, you know. I have to believe that as Diana and yourself is still together that you have filled in a lot of the blanks. I can understand that. My next question, you said you have a DNA report and a letter from my real father. Can I have them? She smiled, and this time it was with the first bit of genuine warmth I had seen from her in years. Yeah, Harry, you can have them. I was about to get them for Diana when everything happened, but they are still buried under a false panel in the bottom of my winter clothes draw. If you can get to the house and ask my lawyer to grant you access, you can retrieve them yourself. Unfortunately, I imagine that I will not be able to get out of here in the near future. I don't imagine so. This next one is hard for me to ask. Did I ever do anything wrong that made you not love me? Before I could pull away from the table, I was resting my hands on. She reached her handcuffed hands over and put them on my hands. No Harry, you never did anything wrong. It was me that did it all wrong. I thought that by keeping you at arm's length, by taking the worst of the beatings and not helping you, I would protect you from the worst of what they could do to you. But I was wrong. From my perspective, I thought I was doing all I could to keep you safe. Though I will admit that perspective was forced through a certain lens. I love you, sweetie, and I know this means nothing to you. And the words sound hollow, but I really do love you. I am so proud of you of everything that you have accomplished. You are ten times the man that my husband is. I may never get the chance to say it again, but I do love you, and I will always love you. I am sorry for everything. You are my son, and I have screwed everything up. However, if today has helped you to get some things right in your head, and it has given you closure to help you move forward, then it is all I can ask for. With that, the conversation hit a dead end. Mum pulled her hands back, and we looked at each other for a bit. Then, finally, she stood and moved over to the door, and a guard came to open it. As she walked through it, she looked back at me. One last thing, sweetie, they may have called you the mistake, you're not. You were conceived in the act of love between George and me, you are my greatest accomplishment, and if we never speak again, know that I will always be proud of the man that you have become. And with that, she went out. I sat there for a few minutes. It appears that my mother had it as hard if not worse at home, regularly being beaten like me. My family was seriously messed up. I didn't take long, though, before there was a knock on the door. You ready for the next one, Mr. Other? The guard asked. Yep, bring her in. If Mum looked terrible, then Joan looked worse, wearing the same coveralls that Mum was. Joan sat down at the table and glared at me. Her hair was short but wild. She had a fresh scar on her cheek and looked like she had not slept in days. When she wasn't glaring daggers at me, she looked around the room like the walls were going to jump out and grab her. For a princess that had everything handed to her, this must have been very different to her. I must admit that while after talking with mom, I could understand her point of view, but Joan, who was supposed to be my sister, was a complete mystery to me. Again, it wasn't me opening the dialogue. You know, there are a lot of criminals in here that know who you are, Joan told me as a statement of fact, and I worry about that. Why? There are quite a number of their family that work for you, or one of your suppliers. It appears that you're quite a celebrity around town, you young, 
rich, and help create lots of jobs. Apparently, you happy to help charities, including ones that get criminals on their feet. None of this is news to me, Joan. I work hard to support the community. After my upbringing, I want to help people. If it costs time, money, or a little sweat, then I'll do it. There it is, the self-righteous prick that my family has raised that is not even a blood member of the family. He's so far stuck up himself that he cares nothing for us, and I've been in here almost a month, and all I hear once they know I'm your sister is how great you are for helping everyone. Yet in all this time, you have done nothing to help me. I cocked my head to the side, questioning her last statement, help you, Joan. After everything that you have done to Diana and me, why the hell would you think that I want to help you? If she was affected by the venom of my snapback, she didn't show it. Because I'm your sister, you were supposed to protect me, use your money and influence to get me out of here. Why would I want to get you out of here? Again, I am you, sister. Don't you care about me? A few of the criminals here found out what we did to that 304 Diana, and they come to find me in the middle of the night and make me do things. I would not have thought she would be so opposed to it for a woman who made my wife and my mother do what I assumed were similar things but I supposed it was different when the shoe is on the other foot. Joan, let me set the record straight here for a moment. First, don't ever let me hear you call my wife a 304 again. You, your father, and your brother all drugged her, assaulted her, and of course, it was against her will. She is the victim here, not you. And as far as helping you, you can go and screw yourself. You have the audacity after what you did to Diana, to what you have done to me, to ask for help. I laughed hard in her face, and she drew back. Let me remind you of why. There was a time years ago when your father was at work. Your brother was too busy in his own importance to help you learn to ride a bike. So you that you asked me to help. Do you recall the bike? It was a girl's first bike. Tassels on the handles, a basket, and a big noisy bell that you liked to ring. As no one else would help, I spent the next few weeks helping you to learn a ride. It was some of the best memories of my childhood. I was helpful to someone. And you were happy and excited to have me help you. For once, I gotta be a big brother. And at that time. I had a little sister who loved and adored me. We even went riding around the neighborhood together, brother and sister just out and about. Not long after that, I suspect your father and brother told you something of the secrets about me that I have only recently learned. Because almost overnight, you grew cold to me, you no longer wanted to go riding. I had been asking for a few weeks, and then one day it happened, when I asked you if you wanted to go for a ride, you sneered at me and told me, and I quote screw off mistake, if you ever think I am going to ride with a loser like you, then you were sadly dreaming. It was that afternoon that my sister died. Since that time, I don't think you noticed, or that you even cared that I never spoke to you. Every conversation that we had was indirect. Even your prick of a big brother talked to me directly. But you? No. You took my love for you and threw it back in my face. It died with one sentence that you never tried to put right. You can't accept that you were in here because your own selfish actions are your own problem. No, Joan. I won't lift a finger to help you. Actually, I will make sure that you get the maximum time to pay for your crimes. You say they are criminals in here. Well, look in the mirror. Oh, and those help programs that I help fund you mentioned earlier, I am going to make it known that if any of them try to assist you that I will pull the funding they get from me. I stood, this meeting just about over. I asked for this meeting today to see if there was any remorse in your heart. After everything that you did, I wanted to know if you had any regrets about what you did to my wife, or if you even cared for me at all. However, from the moment you walked in the door, you didn't ask about Diana. You never even asked about me. You didn't even remotely come close to trying to apologize or say sorry. All you cared about was your selfish desires. No, Joan, you are dead to me, and you better get used to these walls because, with everything you have done, you're going to be here a very long time. And as for money, you will never see a single cent from me. When I walk out the door, if I have it my way, we will never meet again. I took a small object from my pocket and put it on the desk. It was a small figuring of a bike, very similar to the one I taught her to ride. But I will leave you with this reminder. A reminder of better times when a brother and sister learned to ride together. I will mourn the sister I lost that day. I will always recall fondly the time that time we spent on our bike together. However, I am sure you will remember me for a long time. Goodbye, Joan. And I will pray to God that you die a horrible death behind these walls. I knocked on the door, and the guard extorted me out. My last look at Joan was her head downcast the little bike, figurine sitting on the table. Sitting in the reception area, Diana and Tim were sitting and quietly talking. They both rose as I approached. Diana slid into my arms, her now very pregnant belly pushing up against me. How did it go? Tim asked. In some ways, just how I thought it would. 
and others very different. I think my mother is in true regret of everything that happened. She never asked for help or tried to pass the blame for anything. Rather, she is trying to take the blame for everything. I also think from what she told me that she has suffered at the hands of Roger, Greg, and Joan more than Diana and I put together. Diana gasped. What surprised me is that she asked about Diana as her first question. I looked down at my pregnant wife in my arms and smiled. Joan, however, was a different matter. She only wanted me to spring her, never tried to make amends, never asked anything. I think that Roger has truly poisoned her again me, and I will ensure that the charges are enforced on Joan. I gestured to the walls of the prison. In my view, she can rot in this place. We talked for a while, and I could sense that Tim wanted to let us know something. Guys, I've had a report overnight that one of the trucks from Roger's company yard was stolen last night, and that security footage showed two people looking a lot like Roger and Greg breaking in. We're on high alert, and our community watch has been looking out, but please be careful over the next few days. We assured him that we would be on the lookout, and both Diana and myself made sure we had our panic devices on us. I also called our security firm and let them know they would double the patrols around the house and the office as a precaution. It had been an emotionally draining afternoon. The conversations with my mother and Joan had tired me out, and with a pregnant wife, she also got tired quickly. So we were happy to head straight home as I was looking forward to a light dinner and sometime in front of the TV snuggling with Diana tonight. We headed out to my Camaro, and I helped Diana into it. As I helped her in, I realized that I would have to get another car, something easier to get kids in and out. While I loved my car, it just wasn't a practical family car. Perhaps another Jeep or a Range Rover might be okay. But, as I hit the ignition, I thought no, a four-door V8 AMG might be fun. We had not even exited the prison car park when Diana started with her questions. Harry, are you truly done with your mother and sister? Thought for a moment. With Joan, I am not even yet. I will make sure that she gets what she deserves. My mother, I don't know. I felt she was pretty truthful with me for the first time. And if it is the truth then, she has been through a lot more than us. Also, a lot of what she told me matches what you told me in the hospital. I snapped my fingers. Oh, she told me where I could find the DNA report and a letter to me from my real father. I got sad then. She also told me that my real father was the real true love of her life. I don't know how much she truly loved Roger versus being forced to stay because of three, well, two and a half kids, but I am a little biased when it comes to Roger, so that I couldn't say for sure. There is a part of me that wants to forgive her. I think she truly cares but had no way out. We had pulled up to an intersection. Traffic, there wasn't much traffic around this time of the evening. And we were sitting at a red light, talking about the day. Emotionally drained but happy to be moving forward when the truck came barreling towards us. Instead of driving through the intersection like normal, as it went through the lights, it swerved. And in the early evening twilight, its headlights lined up directly on my driver's side door. Sitting in the driver's seat with an almost maniacal smile on his face with Greg, beside him screaming in joy, was Roger. They say that there are moments in your life where everything slows to a crawl, your life flashes before your eyes, and you can reflect before you get caught up. I can tell you that everything did slow down from my point of view, but I didn't see my life flash before my eyes, and that was a good thing. I had moments to react, or I would be dead. The way that Greg was driving the truck, they were aimed at the side of the Camaro, in moments, they were going to plow directly into my driver's door, and it would crumble and likely kill me. As it was, the momentum would most likely seriously injure if not kill Diana sitting in the passenger's seat beside me. Without thinking, I put the accelerator to the floor, and all 550 kilowatts of power in the enhanced Camaro engine came to life. The car started to accelerate rapidly through the intersection, but it wasn't going to be enough. The truck had momentum, where I was trying to move from a standing start. They collided on the rear quarter of the car connecting almost in line with the rear wheel. Hold on. I yelled at Diana. The initial impact was causing the screaming of metal and stressing of plastic before it breaks. We were spun out of control, the Camaro still under acceleration, but all of the momentum changing from moving forwards into careening sideways. Once, twice, and then almost a third time before we came to a stop. We looked at each other. Are you okay? Are you hurt? I asked Diana. She shook her head. I don't think I am hurt. Are you okay? Yeah, I think so. I grabbed my panic token, held it up to Diana and pressed the panic stud. She did the same thing, held it up and pressed the button, and we both saw the tiny LED lights glowing on each, meaning they had been activated. Hopefully, in a few minutes, we would have helped. It's Roger and Greg. They rammed us. I tried to look around the car to find where the truck hand ended up 
and noticed that it was almost directly in front of us with how the Camaro had spun around. We were virtually facing back the way we had been coming. We were lucky the car had not spun further, or we could have flipped over the traffic island on the other side of the intersection. The truck, however, ran into the traffic light pole as it deflected off the side of my Camaro. Peering at the truck, I could see that Roger and Greg were a little stunned but climbing down out of the cab. I wasn't sure if we should stay put, get out and run or face them. Staying in the car was not a bad idea. All the windows were intact, which was hard to believe with the force we were hit, though there was a massive crack in my driver's side window. On the other hand, running would be complicated with a pregnant wife, and I was in trouble in a fight two-on-one. Honestly, I don't think I could take even one of them, so another option was to stall, get out of the car, and try to delay them. If I could get them to talk for a decent amount of time, help could arrive. I thought delay might be the best option. D. Please trust me. I opened the door and got out, walking around the car and avoiding the debris of the accident. Several panels from my Camaro were littered on the ground, as well as the front grille and some bars from the truck. I moved around to the passenger side of the car, letting Roger and Greg see me, but trying to ensure that they didn't think I had seen them yet. I had to act this one to give us time. I needed them to believe that I had not noticed it was them. I went around to Diana's door and yanked it open, helping her out to her feet. I then turned towards our two assailants and froze. They were standing very casually, no worse for wear from the accident. However, they looked haggard with worn faces, unkempt beards, and tattered clothes. They looked like they had lost weight, a lot of the muscle generated working construction lost. There was a wild look in their eyes, something of a maniacal let loose. But the scary thing was what they were carrying. In each of their hands, they held a cheap-looking but very deadly-looking shotgun. I moved Diana and I so the passenger door could act as a partial barrier between us. Of course, they were still some 30 meters away from us, but with guns, you never knew. Well, 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 if it isn't the mistake in his wife, fancy meeting you here of all places, Greg gestured to my car. It looks like you have been in an accident. Isn't it fortunate that we happened to come along? His smile was almost genuine. However, it was also dark. Enough, Greg. Roger snapped, then fixed his eyes on me. They were holding their weapons casually for the moment. Boy, you owe me. You and your wife. You should not have gone to the police. You were supposed to do what I told you to do. Not run, not talk, and not talk to the cops. After all, I have done for you over the years, treating you as one of my family. You owe me. I owe you nothing, was my response. Shit, I thought I should not engage them. Nothing. How about all the years I clothed you? the years I feed you, the years that I let you exist. I took a step towards them. I ignored the threat they and their guns posed for a moment, my anger rising. I had engaged them, so let's have it out. In the back of my mind I knew that help was on the way. How about all the years of abuse? The beatings, the bruises, the mental abuse, the abandonment. How about the piss-poor excuse for a father you were to me? Your refusal to even acknowledge me as a son. He laughed. Haven't you figured it out? You're not my son. You never were. I allowed you to exist because of my kindness, but I had to do nothing more than that. My wife was a 304 and screwed another man behind my back while I was working hard to make a life for us, then hid it from me until it was too late. You're a mistake, unwanted. A piece of dog shit on my boot that I could never scrap off or get rid of the smell. He was waving the gun but not pointing it. When he looked at me, he noticed I wasn't unraveled or shocked at his revelation. His eyes narrowed. Ah, it looks like someone told you recently if I had to guess too. Haven't they boy? Was it your mother or a wife that stands beside you now? Like she has some pillar of virtue. Has your wife told you that she was a 304 before you even met her, that she slept with her uncle and has been a 304 for your entire marriage? Diana started to protest. It was my turn to laugh. Wow, just wow. You are one of the most pathetic individuals I have ever met. Yes. My beautiful wife and my sorry mother have let me know that the low-life piece of shit standing before me is not my father. And yes, Diana and I have spoken about her past. I know the truth, and I love her because of how strong she is despite the tragedy of what she has been through. But it was me that figured out that you were not my dad. You have never been. Dads look out for their kids, biological or otherwise. They become part of their lives and encourage them to grow and take when they succeed and comfort them when they fall. So nah. You were never my dad and standing here now I must say that I don't regret that. But you know what's worse Roger. What is worse is that your head is stuck so far up your own but due to your poor wounded pride that you can't even see that you broke your other children too. I know the truth, not the half-truths and lies that you're telling. Well, aren't you a smart one? 
But that doesn't change the fact that you still owe me, boy. He raised the shotgun, and I moved out from behind the cover of the door, pushing Diana to stay there and raising my hands. If I was going to get shot, I was hoping to save her. So, what's this then? Your piss-poor excuse at trying to get payment from me? If this was all about extorting money, then trying to kill me is a stupid way to do it. Hey laughed. You don't get it, do you, boy? That child growing in your wife's belly is either mine or my real son's. So with you dead, my child will inherit your money. Thereby I win. That's stupid logic. Long before any of this stupidity began, I have made sure that neither you will ever see a dollar of my money. Have you never understood why you couldn't get your hands on it? It's because you treated me like shit my entire life. I made sure that no one in your family could touch it if something happened to me. After you did what you did to Diana, I have already set the wheels in motion to make sure that my money will now be used to ensure you are put into some dark place where the moss will grow on your head and tiny little thing that you call a pecker can never touch anyone ever again. I think I was having somewhat of an effect, but perhaps Roger was losing it as he threw back his head and again laughed. He pointed at Diana standing behind the broken Camaro car door. I drilled her, we all did, and she was a shit lay, but she took our loads all the same. And while you're putting on a brave face, I know you, boy. Deep inside you're in pain as we made you a cuck father. Your mother helped too, your sister drugged her, and Greg and I made her pregnant. As he spoke, he came closer, and Diana went pale and shrank behind me. Roger stopped a few feet in front of me. Face it, boy. You're going to go to your grave being outdone by a man much greater than you. I threw my head back, and it was my turn to laugh hysterically. I needed more time, and I think I needed to take a bit of action. It would be perilous, but it would potentially save Diana. I laughed deep, pulling my breath into my lungs and making the laugh deep and loud. Roger and Greg stopped. Diana started as if I had broken. Roger, you're one stupid son of a bitch. You know that. That child isn't yours or Greg's. It's mine. You maimed my beautiful wife, but she was already pregnant. We have been thinking about a child for over two months, and she went off the pill a month before that. We were doing it twice a day, and according to the doctors, my motility is through the roof. Diana and I made love twice that day before your little daughter drugged my wife. And besides, I looked down at their crotches, we all know both of you are a little under average. With those little packages you might have thought you were getting in there, but I doubt that either of you could get close enough to a woman to do the deed. Not unlike the good seven and a half that my wife has for her exclusive use. I had pushed them, insulted their manhood, and told them I was better than in bed. Anger was written on both their faces, but also a whole lot of embarrassment. Out of the corner of my eyes in the distance, I could see lights approaching, but I doubt they were going to make it. I was going to have to do something stupid. I held up my hand as they both lifted their weapons to point at me. Wait, stop. I said, just laughing a little to keep up the pretense that I was not a threat, and perhaps a little unstable. They lowered their weapons just a little, but I couldn't help having one more dig at them. Roger, could you tell me? Did mum have to go and get artificially inseminated to have Greg and Joan? Because I know that my real father gave mum everything she needed. Apparently, he was a pretty big guy. He was loving and made her climax over and over again. Apparently, you are a big turd in the sack, and she can never feel you enter her. I smiled. I could see Roger would only need another slight push before he would react, and I would need to move quickly. I hear that you are so bad that she needs a whole lot of lube, which surprises me because you are so small. While a son should never hear the details of his mother's sex life, this afternoon, as I spoke to her, it was good to know that you couldn't satisfy a woman even if she was moments from orgasm and needed you to finish her. I won't be surprised now if mum gets out of prison that she'll divorce you and try to find my real father George and marry him. I had goaded them into attacking me like I wanted, keeping the focus off Diana. Roger raised the gun, his target at me. Greg also trying to follow. George Daniels isn't half the man that I am. He's a bookworm, but at least when I am done with you, I'll know who to go kill next. His finger pulled the trigger, and I dove. He anticipated that I would dive right away from Diana. However, I dove straight forward, directly at him into some of the random car parts that were there. As it was, I got caught by the spread of shotgun pellets. My right shoulder and part of my back hurt took several pellets, and it hurt like hell, but I couldn't stop both Diana's and my lives may depend on what I did. As I tried desperately to make it under the weapon's reach, I drove right into the middle of a few car parts that had come off in the collision including the rear wheel guard. Without too much thought and using the momentum of my dive, I picked up the panel and tried to throw it at where I thought Greg was standing. Greg's shot rang out, however, it missed me. I didn't manage to land a solid hit on Greg. However, 
I did manage to knock his weapon out of his hand, and he would need a few moments to review. I knew I still only had moments, and I ended up grabbing the next piece of debris beside me, which happened to be part of my now wrecked Camaro tailpipe. I don't know if you have seen them, however, they are a kind of sharp edged machine metal finish for the part that sticks out of the rear of the car. Now I was not even a body length from Roger. I grabbed the tailpipe and heavied myself upwards, bringing my makeshift weapon straight out in front of me. By this time, Roger had chambered his new round and got it into line directly point blank in my face as I was rising to my feet. He obviously planned to finish things in one final move. Goodbye, boy, he screamed. I swung the tailpipe upwards as he pressed the trigger, and the shot went off. This time the shot missed me completely but discharged near my left ear over my shoulder. I will say this, shotguns are loud. However, I didn't have time to think, and death was a moment away. Now within range of the off-balanced Roger, I used my tailpipe to push him backwards. Roger fell on his back, and I kept moving. I swung the sharpened edge down and went to use it as a spear. This man had systematically tried to destroy my life and tried to hurt everyone I cared about. I was going to end this by impaling him and remove him from my life. As I drove downwards, I put all the pain, the hurt, the years upon years of abuse, the feeling of betrayal into that one downwards thrust. He was wide-eyed, seeing it coming. His shotgun had been knocked out of his hand, too far away to his right from him to reach. It would have been useless anyway with no round ready to fire, and my rage had a lot of force behind it. Roger saw his impending doom. The moment stretched just like the accident not long ago, and I could feel the end in sight, but I was surprised as my makeshift spear approached terminal velocity. I was hit from the side by something hard. Greg had abandoned his weapon and shoulder charged me knocking me off course. As I rolled, I could see the lights of our help getting closer, but I still wasn't sure if our help would make it. I was back to two on one, and I was not confident I would get out of this alive. But at least Diana would be safe. I was also starting to feel a little out of it due to my shoulder and back injury. Greg was back on his feet after the full body tackle he just gave me. He was stamping his feet like an enraged bull. Common mistake. Let's go, you and me. I'll wipe the floor with your face and screw your woman before your body is even cold. I wasn't sure how I was going to get past this. Greg was almost twice my size, even having been on the run for the last few months. I was injured, my wounds leaking blood everywhere. The only advantage I had a few moments ago was surprise. Add to the fact that Greg knew how to handle himself, I was likely screwed. He was going to wait for me to get up, most likely because he knew he could knock me down again and feel like the man. But then luck, at last, went in my favor. As I put my hand down, it came down on Roger's discarded shotgun. A moment of hope flared as I stood, picking it up and chambered the next round, swinging the weapon round in front of me to point it at Greg. He was charging me, a snarl on his face and something sharp in his hand. Screw you, Greg. And I pulled the trigger. He never knew what hit him as the full range of pellets hit directly in the chest, and he crumpled. I moved slightly to point the gun at Roger and noticed that he had passed out. While my impromptu spear had not hit him in the chest, it had ended up impaling his right arm at almost the shoulder. A good deal of blood was beginning to pool on the ground around him, as I would say his body was going into shock. Well, screw him too. Cars were racing towards us now, and they were going to be here any second. I stumbled back to Diana and found her on her side, gasping for breath, blood also pooling at her side. Her sight was unfocused, her breathing getting raspier. Her back looked covered in wounds from shotgun pellets. It appears that during the fight that she had gotten hit, I wasn't sure how bad it was. There were a dozen spots all over her upper back bleeding. It looked like the car door had deflected quite a bit and protected her lower half, including the baby, but she was injured. Try as I might, I couldn't do anything. Every ounce of energy I had was leaving me with each movement. My shoulder was an open wound, and like Diana, my back was bleeding from a dozen spots. I collapsed down beside her, the last of my energy gone. I think she sensed me there, knowing it was me and not one of the other two. I helped her put her head in my lap. For a moment, her eyes found focus, and we looked deep into each other's eyes. There were no words needed, and for a third time in less than 15 minutes, the moment stretched into forever. As we looked deep into each other's faces, I had nothing but unconditional love moving between us. She was my soulmate. I belonged to her, wholly and completely, but I knew nothing that I could do to help. She reached up a bloody hand to cut my cheek, a gentle and loving caress, tears now spilling from her eyes. Harry, I love you. And she closed her eyes. My daughter was born only a few hours after the fight, where both Diana and I were shot. 
A premature birth brought on by the trauma of the accident, I was absent from the delivery as I was on an operating table under a general anesthetic, having shotgun pellets removed from my shoulder and back as well as a shoulder reconstruction. I was in surgery for over 12 hours and didn't wake up for over two days. Apparently, I passed out mere moments before our security team ran up to us. The ambulance was not far behind, and both Diana and I were loaded and promptly evacuated for surgery. I was later told that Diana was in the operating room for around 20 hours. Her labor with our daughter lasted only three hours, and fortunately, everything came together for a quick, if traumatic, delivery. Immediately after, Diana was rushed and had surgery on her back to remove the pellets and close the wounds. During the fight, I missed that Greg had gotten a second shot off at Diana while I was grappling with Roger and the tailpipe. It had caught her in the back as she was trying to duck down behind the door. Then apparently, Greg had seen me knock Roger down and came to charge me before I could kill his father. We almost lost Diana three times on the operating table. While her injuries from the weapon discharge were not life-threatening, the lack of blood due to childbirth made her very weak. I was the first to wake, both of us in separate beds back in the same suite we had been in earlier. There were five people in the room with us, not including doctors. On the couch on the other side of the room, Jack and Cindy were curled up, sleeping. Over by Diana's sleeping form was June, while on a chair sitting between Diana's and my beds as Norman reading something. But what surprised me was the sleeping form holding my hand in an orange jumpsuit. My mother was there. She was handcuffed to the bed and had her head resting on my hospital bed mattress. But her hand was firmly lodged in mine. I wasn't sure what to make of it, but first things first. I tried to speak. Water, I tried to say, but I think it came out like a light groan. But it stirred the room, and soon everyone was around me. Then, finally, Dr. Hill walked into the room. Someone had obviously paged her. Harry, welcome back. Can you look into the light for me, please? She ran a few tests and was happy that I was waking up. I got a small cup of water and took a sip. Diana? I managed to croak out. Dr. Hill gave me a small, tight smile. She's in her bed to your right. She's still asleep. But we expect her to make a full recovery after a successful labor and surgery. Labor? This time the smile was larger and shared around the room. Harry, you're a father to a tiny but gorgeous little girl. Congratulations. She's currently in the premature ward, and I would say you will be able to visit her in the next couple of days. After she left, everyone came gathering around my bed. I could see looks of concern at my form, happiness that Diana and I were alive and some anger that this had happened to us. Then, finally, after a few rounds of your looking like a truck hit you. Yes, they were poor jokes, but we did all laugh, my mother spoke. What happened, sweetie, a few hours after you left the prison? I got a notification that you had been in an accident. I explained how Roger and Greg had rammed us in the truck after leaving, and how they must have been waiting for us and chose the right time to make their move. I told them of the fight, how I had shot Greg when he charged me and impaled Roger after he missed me at point-blank range. Then I told them how I had found Diana by the car and collapsed. I looked over to see Diana in her hospital bed and saw her eyes open and staring at me, tears in her eyes. Jack immediately ran out and found Dr. Hill, who came back and checked Diana over. No one interrupted Dr. Hill. However, Diana's eyes never left mine, and when she was told that our baby girl was born, the tears rolled down her cheeks. Her voice was weak, but vaguely, she recalled the labor, but not giving birth or our baby surviving. So, can anyone tell me what happened once Diana and I passed out? Norman jumped in. I think I can. I arrived on the scene around 10 minutes after the first responders. I had been alerted that both Diana and yourself had pressed your panic buttons, and there was a team heading your way. When I arrived, both Diana and you were being laid onto stretches and I can tell you the scene was a mess. Apparently, the police only finished the investigation this morning, and I assume that Tim will want to bring the investigation team to interview both of you at some point to validate everything. As I understand it, the intersection is still closed. Once you were both stabilized in the ambulances, you were both brought here for treatment. I stayed with the team at the scene, knowing that both of you were in good hands. June, Jack and Cindy met you both here and have not left your sides. You likely know your Camaro is totaled. There was also a lot of blood, shotgun pellets and car parts everywhere. Once word got out about the accident, the fight, and that shotguns and people on the run were involved, the media were all over it. And when they found out it was local legend Harry Other, our city's youngest millionaire, they went into a frenzy. I have had media requests coming into the office all day. I've even had movie studios reach out they want to buy the rights. Despite my injury, I laughed. Diana also chuckled, 
Who would want to buy the rights to my life? Sure, it hasn't been fun, but it's also sad. I thought, Norman, what happened to Roger and Greg? Norman hesitated a bit, then looked at Martha. My mom nodded. Greg died at the scene. Ambulance crews tried to resuscitate him. However, the damage to his chest was too severe. The police have some working theories about what happened, and I am sure you won't be charged as it all sounds like self-defense. Our legal team are already all over it. Apparently, there is a traffic cam that caught most of it. It's all poor quality video, but it lines up with a lot of what you just said, and I am sure the police will want to hear it from you. I nodded. I had hated Greg with all my soul and I wanted him to suffer for all the pain and torture that he had caused me over the years. However, I don't know how I felt that it was my hand that had taken his life. Surprisingly, it was my mother who put that to rest for me. Handcuffed to my hospital bed, and apparently, there was a uniformed police officer outside my door to keep tabs on her. Harry, I don't want you to feel bad about that. It was always going to come down to you and him, and while I am sad that I have lost a son, I also know that he deserved what he got. Besides, I also know that the son that we all wronged is alive. Besides, when you told us what happened, while I loved Greg, I think I would have pulled the trigger myself if I could have saved you. She cried at the point, and I squeezed her hand. Mom, what are you doing here? She was still weeping but wiped away her tears. It was Norman and Tim's idea. I am still to be sentenced next month, but when I heard you and Diana were in surgery, they reached out to see if I would be willing to come under guard to be here to see you before my arraignment. I have hated what we did to you and Diana, and I meant it when I told you that I would take this shame to my grave. But, when they brought you in, I broke down, so they hooked me up here, she lifted her handcuffed hands, and just kept watch. I am so sorry for everything I did to you. I am sorry to you or well Diana, I am sorry I was not the mother I should have been. I should have protected you from Roger, from Greg, from Joan, I should have told them where to shove it and just left with you. I am sorry, and I know that I won't ever deserve your forgiveness but I will always love you. Now that you're both awake, I will get them to take me now. Before even the next heartbeat, I held up my hand, the four lead hanging from my wrist. This was going to be complicated. Mom, I forgive you. I know we still have a lot to go through, and I think our family is broken forever, but I forgive you. She cried. I know it was more than she expected, and I was surprised that I was willing to forgive. But upon reflecting on everything various people had told me over the last few months, my mother was also a victim of Roger and his kids. She had also been beaten, threatened, sexually abused. If she didn't do what she was told and keep me in line, I would be killed. So I felt that the least I could do was give her some forgiveness. What about Roger? Was that a smile on Norman's face? Well, he's still alive, however. He lost his right arm and a lot of blood after you impaled him on the car part you stabbed him with. He's had two surgeries already, and he will need another two because there is an infection in the arm. In addition, He's under heavy police guard and is pretty much never going to see the outside of prison walls again for his entire life. My mother again chimed in, I've also spoken to my lawyer. Once he's stable, I'm going to divorce him on the grounds of adultery, mental cruelty, alienation of affection, and a few others. I'm not sure what will stick, but I should have done it years ago. Oh, I know I still need to do my time inside, but I won't have anything to do with that man anymore. I never truly loved him, but as we had kids... I stayed with him and couldn't figure out how to escape. So there won't be much in the divorce settlement, but I'll be free in one sense. Next June brought out a manila envelope and handed it to me. Inside was a piece of folded paper and an envelope. Is this? June nodded to my mother. Yesterday, when the police bought her in here while you were asleep, Martha gave me directions and had me retrieve these for you? I looked at mom, and she nodded to me. Everyone watched me open the DNA test results. I wasn't entirely sure what I was looking at. My degree is in chemistry, not biology, so I close it. Someone could help me with that later. Next was the letter. I opened it and began to read. Harry, if you're reading this, you have been told that Roger is not your real father. My name is George Daniels, and I need to tell you that I am your biological father. Your mother and I dated back in high school, and fate tore us apart. Then for a short time, we were brought together, and you were conceived. But Martha was married and already had a child so we chose to end the affair. I hope that I can watch you grow from afar and some point in the future, formally meet you and introduce you to my side of the family. I hope you will be proud to know we are a book intelligent but hardworking. We all enjoy a challenge, and I hope you will inherit this from me. Harry, you are my first child, and I don't know if you will have any siblings when you read this. But, if you do, then I hope we can all meet together. You will always be in my heart. Lots of love always, my son. 
George Daniels. It felt like all I had done is sawing between anger and sadness over the last few months, and again I felt tears in my eyes, but this time, I felt like they were tears of happiness. I had an actual father. I showed the letter to mom, and she also cried. I then called over Jack and Norman and showed them the letter. After Diana had mentioned his name to me months ago, I had suspected. However, Jack confirmed it. Harry George is my older brother. There is quite an age difference, but that is his handwriting. But this would mean that I'm your uncle. I finished. And Norman, that means you're my second cousin? I have thought of both of you as a family since you helped me out in high school. Since then, both of you have always been there when I needed you. Damn, I can't get away with anything anymore. We all laughed. Mum looked at Jack funny. George is your older brother? Jack nodded, and for a few minutes, we watched them talk about the person they knew. It was not long after that that Tim came in with a fellow officer, and it was time to talk my mother back to prison. She looked at Diana then me, and she waited to be unchained and handcuffed. I can't tell you how proud I am of both of you, and I promise you I will spend my every waking moment working towards forgiveness. Diana surprised everyone by asking Martha for a hug before she left. After she left, everyone also began to drift off, now that the current emergency was over. For the first time in a long time, I felt like things were going to be okay. It was perhaps seven in the evening when the next surprise was brought before us. Being wheeled in by three nurses and Dr. Hill, they brought in a premature humidity crib. Inside was our daughter. One of the nurses helped me out of bed and brought my drip over to the crib, while another nurse did the same for Diana. And then they left us alone for a few minutes. It was hard to hug, but physical contact with each other made me feel a million times better. I could feel it was the same for Diana. Charlotte, Diana said as we watched our daughter sleep. It was the second most popular name that we had chosen. Beth was our favorite, but looking at our little girl sleep, sensors hooked up to her and a breathing tube inserted to ensure her health. Charlotte was the correct name, and Charlotte she became. As we held each other's hand, we knew she was ours, not just as parents, but genetically, had not yet even been able to touch her, but I knew that she was neither Roger's nor Greg's child. She was mine. The following month was hard. Both Diana and I had a lot of recovery to do, there were many loose ends to tie up, and we had a tiny child to keep an eye on. Charlotte, or Charlie as we nicknamed her, would be in the special crib for up to three months before her lungs had developed enough that she could breathe on her own. It could be another two months before she could be released from the hospital to come home with us. We were both giddy with excitement after she was taken off the ventilator, and both Diana and I got to hold our little girl for the first time. Norman and I authorized a massive donation to the premature babies ward to appreciate what they had done. We also received the office DNA results confirming what Diana and I both knew in our hearts. I was Charlie's biological father. While we were recovering in hospital, Jack also brought George by to introduce us. Both Diana and I were blown away by the similar features that we shared, and on the comparison, we also saw the family resemblance between Jack and me. George had a wise air about him, had a cool head on his shoulders, and told us how he had followed my career from afar, not wanting to get involved. He was widowed his wife having died three years ago from cancer, but he had a son and a daughter, and he promised to introduce us when we were released. But, of course, his kids knew about me, so there wouldn't be any surprises from their side. I admit that I was a little worried to meet them because my last two siblings had pretty much tried their best to destroy me. Still, once I did meet them, we did become fast friends. Indeed, my half-sister, Megan, came to work for Norman and me within the year doing public relations and today is the head of our public image. My half-brother George Jr. was an academic researcher at a university, and he loved to hand out a glass of wine and chat about any theory that was being discussed. The last thing that happened right before we were released was the court date for my family. Both Diana and I were escorted by hospital staff, including Dr. Hill. Norman, Jack, George, June and Cindy also came along, and of course, the security detail was now ever-present and always within earshot. As our party was escorted in, we sat towards the back of the courtroom. One of the reasons that we were here was that it was possible that we may have been called to provide evidence. While we were recovering, my arm was now in a sling, and my back itched like crazy, but otherwise, I was doing okay. Diana also had a consistent sore back. However, it was also healing. Each of the three on trial was brought in separately. Roger and Joan had public defenders. However, I had retained one of my legal team to support my mother. The judge banged his gavel and started the proceedings. I would like to thank everyone here for their time today. Please note that this is a closed court today. This is due to the sensitive nature of the discussion and the spectacular nature in which events proceed. 
I note that each of the three defendants has retained a separate legal counsel and requested that they be tried separately. Does the prosecution agree? An elderly man with many aides stood and addressed the judge. We do you honor. The trial was a criminal case due to everything in a matter of the state instead of a civil suit. So it was the state verses of each of the defendants. First up was Joan. She looked a little better than when I had seen her, but not much. She wore a simple suit that you might pick up at a thrift shop and no makeup. She looked at me a couple of times. The first time was a shock seeing me there. The second time was with anger as she understood that I would not do anything to help her. The last time was much later as the judge read his verdict, and she stared at me, but I couldn't read her. The lawyers went through the list of charges, what they meant and how they played out in both the prosecution and defensive manner. Diana was called as a witness. However, there was already a statement prepared by our legal team and submitted for this case which the judge was happy to accept. With all the evidence presented, how does the accused plea? asked the judge. Joan's public defender stood with her. On behalf of my client, I have been instructed to plead no guilty. So, noted. Next was my mother, and again everything was presented, and this time the prosecution went back to her affair of which I was the result. Her defense pointed out the abuse that she undertook from Roger, Greg, and Joan along the way. However, my mother's presentation of the facts never tried to hide her involvement in the matters surrounding my wife's assault. Several times she looked over at us, but never said anything. With all the evidence presented, how does the accused plea? asked the judge. Mum and her lawyer stood. On behalf of my client, I have been instructed to plead guilty. So, noted. Next was my former father. He was still looking quite beaten up, the stump of his arm was bandaged, and he had a bit of a limp when he came in. He was dressed in the prison overalls. No suit had been provided for him. He glared up at us and sat down. Again, the lawyers went to town. However, I could tell that his public defendant was just going through the motions. His public defender blushed when the charges were read out. He had heard of assault and attempted murder before. However, assault with the intent to cuck his son were things that he was not likely to hear again. One unique one that surprised him was that Mum had managed to work in that she would like the divorce settled as part of this hearing. The logic was that they were not ever going to be living in the same house again, and it was likely that they were both to be in prison for the foreseeable future, so she would like to get it out of the way. After hearing the case against my mother, and then the evidence against Roger, the judge allowed it. There was not much in the way of defense, a number of pre-prepared statements were read, and it didn't look good for my former father. Even when the reasons for divorce were presented, they made Roger look like a monster. With all the evidence presented, how does the accused plea? asked the judge. Roger and his lawyer stood, on behalf of my client, I have been instructed to plead not guilty. So, noted. The court will now be in recess until three this afternoon when I will pronounce judgment and sentencing. He banged his gavel and left. George was waiting outside for us. Norman and George took us to a little cafe that looked like it had seen better days. However, they told us they had the best toasted sandwiches and milkshakes. Apparently, George took Norman out a few times as a kid and his nephew to have a great lunch. With everyone, including our hospital and security team, we almost packed out the place. But, the guys were right, great toasted sandwiches. Finally, at three, we all made our way back into the courtroom. The judge came back in and brought us to order. This case has some apparent villains and victims. However, there are also hidden heroes and underappreciated players. Today, we have heard the stories of many people around the three accused here today and I must admit that I have wrestled mightily in trying to figure out the right course of justice and the proper punishment for each of them. On one hand, we have a family potentially torn apart by a wife's infidelity, its impact being heard down through the ages, on the other. Unfortunately, the family's chosen reaction was violence and abuse, rather than removal and separation like any other family would do in this situation. When this court considers the manipulation of people over a long period and often threatening of lives, including children, this court cannot help but be appalled by particular individual's behavior. And it is noted that this behavior has resulted in the death of at least one individual. Each of the accused here today has requested to be tried and sentenced separately. As such, this has occurred, and my judgments in this matter reflect that. Accordingly, I would ask that the accused and their representation rise. In the matter of the state versus Joan Other, this court finds the defendant guilty of all charges and sentence you to a period of incarceration of no less than 12 years. You will not be eligible for parole for at least 8 years, and due to your lack of remorse for your actions, I will be placing a letter for assessment ready for the parole board to consider before reviewing you for parole. In the matter of the state versus Martha Other, 
This court finds you guilty of all charges except for mental cruelty against Mrs. Diana, Other, and Mr. Harry Other. This court further acknowledges the entered plea of guilty and the acceptance of your actions. I also have a sworn character statement from your son, Mr. Harry Other, and your daughter-in-law, Mrs. Diana Other, attesting to your outstanding moral character once things came to light. Lastly, this court also acknowledges the mental and physical abuse that you were placed under while in the household. It is the judgment of this court that Mrs. Martha Other is sentenced to a period of incarceration of five years with eligibility for parole in one year. In the matter of the state versus Roger Other, this court finds the defendant guilty of all charges and sentences you to life in prison. However, this court will not set a parole period as we find the crimes you committed against all parties, including your wife, Mr. Harry Other, and even your deceased son are some of the most devious manipulations I have seen in this courtroom. In my closing statement, I would like to note the bravery of both Mr. Harry Other and Mrs. Diana Other. As the evidence was read, we have heard in this court time and time again the plots and plans against them. However, with each challenge, they stood and worked till they found their way through, they found each other and, in a society, when it is often easier to separate and walk away, when things got tough, they bonded closer. We are honored and privileged to have them in our midst. Bailiff, the defendants are remanded to your custody. The gavel was slammed for the last time, and it was finished. A couple of months later, we got to bring Charlotte home, and that afternoon we had a massive party at our place. Our friends, a number of work colleagues, and almost all of the family I had never met from George's side were there. Charlotte was the perfect baby, and all the ladies agreed that she was the cutest baby ever. We want to see my mother once a month, and even took Charlotte with us a few times. Mum was in a minimum security prison and was so proud to hold her granddaughter. Each time we visited she cried, and always ended with some of the biggest hugs and so many kisses for our daughter. It was like she was making up for lost time. Mum had also started working with some of the victims' groups in prison to get help for what she had been through and help others in a similar situation. When she hit the year mark and was released, we had another big party for her welcome home. It was strange. Growing up, Mum had always been standoffish, however free from Roger's control. She became a different woman, kind and loving, considerate to everyone around her. She would hug me and kiss me whenever she got the chance. She stayed with Diana and me for two years after that. And to be honest, we needed the help. Charlotte was just over a year old, and we had just found out that Diana was pregnant again. Having Grandma around was a huge help. After she got out, Mum would go and visit Joan every couple of months. However, from what I heard, Joan was still self-centered and even Mum was tired of the blame and excuses. She never went to see Roger again, and I had heard that he had it pretty rough on the inside. I got to know George quite well, we shared a love of knowledge, and while I never called him dad, we did have a strong relationship. He would spend quite a bit of time around our place, and first, I thought it was just about me. But I did have to laugh one night as Diana was approaching term with our second child when I caught George sneaking out of my mother's room. Not long after the court case, Jack and Cindy got engaged, and then not long after, Diana gave birth to our son Harry Jr. Jack and Cindy got married when he was three months old. I was Jack's best man, and Diana was Cindy's maid of honor. Charlotte was the cutest flower girl. We also found out not long after the wedding that Cindy was already pregnant, so they would have their first child within six months of being married. Work was good, and as life settled into a new normal, I, at last, got the new components done to improve our efficiency. It was over a year since I had set out to complete that project, and it felt good to get it done. In addition, we had expanded our operations, and more and more companies were asking for our product. Diana and I kept investing in each other, and sure we had the fights that all couples do. We disagreed on things that don't matter, and now and then got into big fights over leaving the kitchen in a mess, or forgetting to pick up milk on the way home. But we never let getting upset stop us from communicating. We also picked up a wise tip if you were angry and fighting with each other. Strip naked before continuing the argument. We learned that a lot of anger at your spouse leaves you if you're looking at the one you love naked, and after a good bout of sex, you could calmly talk about the things that matter and what you're fighting about. Thanks to everything we went through in the early years, we had a few challenges around secrets and sharing. I wouldn't say it was really a trust issue, but a few raw nerves could send one or both of us into a mood. However, one outcome of everything was that Diana very rarely wanted to be more than five minutes away from me. So we continued to seek help for years afterwards. The offer from the studios was legitimate, and we had a TV studio pick up our story, and they made quite a good drama out of it. I enjoyed the actor who played Batman's portraying me. He's a lot more buff than me but could pull off the nerd look well. But they outdid themselves on Diana. Black Widow? Nope. We used the check from royalties each year and put it into domestic violence within families. 
We learn through our situation it is not just men that hurt women, but it can go any which way, and we do what we can to help those who suffer. One Saturday morning years later, we were sitting down to plan Charlotte's 10th birthday party when Mum came in looking a little gloomy. She had George on her arm, and I noticed how close they were becoming. Perhaps my mother and father could start dating. But hey, stranger things have happened. What's wrong, Mum? You look like someone died. Someone did, and I don't know if I care, was her response. It was Roger, wasn't it? asked Diana. Mum just nodded. You know what, Mum? Remember the good times and know that we have all moved past all the bad. He tried to break us, but he just brought us together stronger. That's the problem, Harry. I can't remember a single good time with Roger, and that is what makes me sad. I wasted so much time, but life is never fair, she quoted one of Roger's old sayings. That evening, I was lying in bed waiting for my sexy wife to come into the room, and when she did, she didn't disappoint. She was naked. Her hips were a little wider after two kids, but I still worshipped that body. She giggled, well, hello, sailor, she quoted seeing the growing mast under the bedsheet. You never cease to amaze me, D. How's that? Despite all we have been through, the good and the bad, you still have eyes only for me. Everyone else would have run to the hills, yet you're still here. Do you know why my love? My money? She snorted. No. My charming wit and humor? She smiled. Nope. Then it must be my Johnny and my prowess in bed giving you climax after climax. She paused to think, well, that one is true, but no. Okay, you tell me why. Because, Harry, you never ran away when things got tough. You always ran towards me. So I will always run to you too. Never has a woman been so lucky. I smiled, then frowned. Life just keeps coming, good and bad. It just keeps coming, doesn't it? Are you thinking this way because of the news about Roger? I guess, from being a kid to meeting you, starting the company, the events around Charlie's birth and everything. Roger was involved in all of that. Of course, I hated him, but there is part of me that just wanted him to want me, to show me something of fatherly love, and now he's gone. Don't my love. Don't think like that because he was nothing compared to you. You beat him at every game he threw at you. You not only won but you thrived, but not only that, unlike him, you got the girl. When your wife tells you you're right, never argue, especially when she spends the next hour making sure she uses her body to show how much the girl was into you. Dear listeners, Please share your thoughts in the comments section below and don't forget to like, share, and subscribe.